You are live. We are live. Yeah. Hello, hello, everyone. We're just going to give everybody uh, a few seconds to, to get uh, settled into the room here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, we're so far we're at 131 in the room. If you are here, come say hi. Seeing some familiar names. Hi, Kimberly, over from Oliver, BC. Uh, Denny from Setil, welcome, bienvenue. Bienvenue au Quebec. Okay, I'm going to turn my slides on with a big welcome. So uh, you're here at tonight's COPA safety seminar for our buying your first aircraft session. Um, and and I'll, I'll introduce the speakers in a moment. Just want to welcome you and thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, our, our seminar itself is sponsored by Forflight, who is with us, as well as uh, Pull Employee Benefits. So just a, a quick plug for anyone who is a current member or a prospective member, there are a lot of benefits that come uh, with with just association with COPA itself. Uh, of course, these safety seminars are free, um, but being a, a member entitles you to health and dental plans, uh, emergency travel and medical insurance, uh, all, all kinds of good stuff. So check out our website for more information on that. And we have been hinting at it for a few months now, but I'm very excited to share today. Uh, and I might put this back at, up at the end of the evening, but um, for just for participating as a COPA member, you are entitled to potentially winning one of these three prizes. Uh, so the more seminars that you attend, the more that you'll be able to, um, Oh, I'm just going to mute everybody here one moment. The more that you attend, the more that you'll likely, uh, you'll, you'll get ballots to enter into these this draw. So the first prize is valued at 2,600. Uh, I did not stutter there. So it comes with a Lost Aviator coffee prize pack. So anyone's a big, who's a big supporter of uh, the Lost Aviator, Aviator coffee group, they have fantastic blends that are available. They've donated a prize pack. We also have a Garmin D2 Air watch. Uh, you can see a photo of it on the screen. That's valued at 700 plus a Sirius XM package. Um, it comes with a one year of Pilot Pro Aviation weather one year of their all access entertainment uh, and uh, an activation fee. We will give you a one year COPA membership, whether you're new, well, renewing, I suppose, as a COPA member. Uh, we will also provide you registration to our fly in in 2022 uh, when in person will hopefully be happening again. We're certainly planning for it and we're very excited. Uh, so, that's coming uh, in June of 2022, and you'll be able to, to have your fees waived, as well as a $100 gift card to Aircraft Spruce. So that's the first prize. Uh, the second prize, uh, pretty much similar with a few um, adjustments, and that prize is valued at $2,400. Uh, it comes with a, a Garmin watch, uh, the Sirius XM package, the, the registration to our COPA fly-in, as well as a $100 gift card to Aircraft Spruce. And the third prize valued at 150 still gives you um, access to our national fly-in uh, in Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu, uh, as well as a $50 gift card to our COPA store. So very excited to share that and and how you, uh, <laughs> nice bribery, We're, we'll get you everywhere. Yes, thank you very much. This is our intention. Uh, we want to reward you for simply attending these seminars and you, many of you religiously have been following along and we, we certainly have uh, noted that. And um, Peter and I have been very excited. We've been planning the 2020, 2022 schedule and it'll certainly have some relevant topics to this group here. So the more you attend, the more likely uh, you'll have ballots. And uh, these will be the three prizes um, that are up for grabs. So 
with that, uh, I had mentioned that we have Four Flight here today. Um, they are one of our sponsors, and without our sponsors, we wouldn't be able to offer a free program. We wouldn't be able to offer these these great uh, prizes. So we'd love to um, invite over Dominic. Oshmanic, uh, to come and, and present a, and share a little bit of information about the organization itself. So, hey, Dominic, how are you doing? I'll, I'll turn on your slides right now, but tell us where you're at. Awesome. Thanks, Sharon. Really appreciate that. And hello, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know Four Flight or have been flying with Four Flight the, your entire uh, flying careers or uh, just for pleasure, um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you. And if not, then I would just like to give you a, a brief introduction of, of what we're all about and um, a little insight to how we how we got here. Uh, so let me just start the slide right there. And Sharon, can you see that or not yet? It looks great. I can see it. You can? Okay. So I just have a blank screen in front of me right now, but let me try. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Um, so Four Flight for Canadians. Um, it often gets overlooked, but Four Flight has a very dedicated set of individuals for Canada uh, to develop Canadian content and to make sure everything is supported up here. Now, I personally started with Four Flight about six years ago, and um, it was a much different company back then, even you know just size-wise. Uh, but I got involved with them pretty early on when I was when I was flight instructing, and my job is definitely not sales. So I'm I'm not here to sell anything. Uh, my primary job here in Canada is to support and educate pilots on Four Flight uh, to further their. It, um, knowledge on the program if they're using it already and to educate those that might be using something else or are still using paper charts. So uh, my official title of Fourfly is a pilot support team member uh, and I specifically handle Canadian content. A um, little bit about today's topics, just a, a quick run through about the what is for flight the integrated flight application concept um what you can do as far as filing capabilities through for flight um and weather tools we've updated a lot of cool weather features recently which is is nice and um some in-flight weather options for canadians as well and then at the at the very end i'll just run through a quick you know subscription if you're interested in in, in subscribing type thing um, who we are? Well, Four Flight started in um, 2015, I believe. Uh, sorry, 2014, and uh, it was one of the first applications for uh, the iPad. Um, it was founded in 2007, but really didn't really get going until 2010 when the iPad came out, and then kind of went on from there. So I'm sorry, I said 2014. I meant 2010. Um, the, it was one of the first aviation apps for the iPhone and iPad, and it really took off from there. They're headquartered in, uh, we're headquartered in Houston, Texas, with offices now really around the world. Um, with with Boeing recently acquiring Four Flight, um, our reach is really global, so it, it's pretty awesome. Um, over 200 employees, I think that's closer to 400 at this point, um, and more than half of them are pilots. So we understand. What pilots are looking for and uh just trying to to make it as as pilot friendly to everyone as possible now what is an integrated flight app well four flight really brings tries to bring everything together in one place so you're not finding yourself hopping from different applications or trying to find something on a paper chart um that you might not otherwise find in a, in a four flight efb or a or efb itself so integrated flight app, you're looking at airport information, all the vital information you need for flying, your maps, your plates, uh, documents like CFS, VTAs, backs of VTAs, things like that. Um, a logbook, an electronic logbook directly in the app as well uh, to plan and log all your flights, flight planning, uh, weather imagery, the same stuff you, you look at at the AWWS uh, website is available there. Uh, filing and briefing, which I'll touch on a little bit in more detail. Scratchpad for 
not using any paper in the flight deck. You could use a scratch pad. It worked especially nice with the, uh, the Apple Pen there. And overall, just improving situational awareness in the flight deck. You know, the ability to see your aircraft on that maps page navigating through complicated airspace is really is really unmatched. So, um, yeah, it's, it's it's absolutely fantastic to have. And essentially, we go from the good old days to having it for flight, right? Or or some other type of EFB. Now, what more make for flight? What makes Forflight unique is that you really have to, you really can do everything directly from the application. So, the types of filing available um, to Canadian pilots through Forflight are as follows: the VFR filing is available both in Canada and in the United States and cross border. IFR, same thing, um, and Y and Z filing. So, Y and Z filing, if you're going from a VFR flight plan to an IFR flight or an IFR flight to a VFR flight. Um, you can file those types of flight plans in Canada as well. And as I mentioned, you can also file across the border. There are some things you have to keep in mind if you are filing across the border. And that is, um, well, I'll, actually, I'll get into it after this slide. But uh, this is what four flight looks like. And you will do all your flight planning and filing, um, or sorry, I should say filing through the flights tab. Uh, for those of you who might not know, once you get your, your route and all your details set up you can send that over to the flight page and you would fill out basically a digital version of a um, ikl flight plan and send it off it goes directly to nav canada if that's who it's supposed to go to and um it will get passed on to a us um, fss if it's required now what four flight doesn't do at the moment is follow your apis um, do anything with Canadian customs or decals or in our new world now, COVID-19 requirements, all that will have to still be handled separately. Um, Forflight really just deals with the flight planning and filing side of things. Um, but again, if you are planning a cross-border trip, which now with the new restrictions being lifted, um, it's a little more feasible. You can certainly um, do that in Forflight and then just remember to take care of the other usual things as well. We have a entire filing in Canada seminar available on our website. Um, if you just go on www.forflight.com, this is the actual slash campaigns and on frequencies link. Um, if you just go to forflight.com, you can navigate your way through support and um, and videos and and find the video itself as well. So uh, this is where we get into really like. Uh, ICAO codes and making sure your aircraft profile is set up properly um, so that you won't have any issues filing. And um, we get into much further detail, much more than I can get into today. But the capabilities are there. So some weather tools in four flights, since this is a safety seminar, you got to touch on some safety stuff. You want to always get a great weather brief, right? Um, AWWS website for all the Canadians that have started flying here and know what it's all about is fantastic. I have been transitioning to using only for flight and it's absolutely fantastic. Um, you get your animated weather uh, radar, um, visible infrared satellite images, um, everything from your surface analysis as well. I always like to go big picture to small picture. So I'll start with the surface analysis, work my way to satellite radar and kind of go further into the METARs and TAFs after that. Um, all of which is available in app. Here's uh, the visible infrared satellites. I'm sorry, this is the infrared satellite shot. <laughs> um, we've started introducing some really cool forecasting tools as far as icing and turbulence. So this is an example of an icing forecast. Um, there's an altitude slider on the right-hand side there and a severity prediction. I personally, uh, I'm a commercial pilot myself and this is vital for us, um, especially with getting to the flight levels um, and dealing with icing and still flying a turboprop, um, it still becomes an issue. So icing forecasts are great. It goes all the way down to the surface and you can, uh, you can play around with the forecast as well. Uh, in the same regards, turbulence. So turbulence forecast with foreflight, same type of thing. Great for us in the commercial world when we want the smoothest ride. 
um, planning the flight and, and seeing what other altitudes will work is, is great. Um, you'll get your time slider there at the bottom. You'll get the severity and um, the altitude slider as well. And that goes right down to the surface. Winds aloft, uh, we're very familiar looking at winds aloft in this kind of format. That's, that's what the weather website charts are like. You know, you just get your little um, weather uh, wind icon there and you got to figure out how, how intense the wind is, um, different altitudes, which is still an option for flight. But recently we've taken it one step further and we've introduced something called dynamic winds. So you'll actually be able to look at winds in real time and uh, the, as far as the temperature wise and the severity. So right now, this will give you wind temperatures at different altitudes, which is kind of neat, and the forecast for the future, as well as your wind speeds. So wind speeds, you know, here at 3,000 feet, we see that there's a, a, lot, a big con area in the west, and then that, those wind speeds start to pick up um, more in the east. So it's a really cool kind of feature, and, and it, you're able to hit play and kind of uh, figure out where the prevailing winds are coming from in your general area there and plan accordingly. Uh, we get this question very often, uh, especially for Canadian pilots, is what are my weather options in flight? Now, unfortunately, as, as probably all know, we're not blessed with the um, ADSB weather stations like uh, like in the States, but there are still options. And those options are the Garmin GDL 30, uh, 51 and 52. Um, these with a Sirius XM weather subscription is a great option for Canadian pilots because it will display um, all that information right in the flight. The Sirius um, package will give you high res uh, radar, all your METARs, TAFs, echo tops, um, uh, cloud to cloud lightning, surface winds, all that stuff directly in the air. And it has a lot of advantages against ADSB as well. It's not limited to, to line of sight, which is which is nice. Um, on top of having that, you will need a Sirius XM subscription uh, specifically for four flight, and it's about forty dollars a month. And it does uh, include both U.S. and Canadian weather, uh, weather as well. If you're interested in that, visit uh, fourflight.com/connect or Sirius XM directly. Um, both websites will have the same, same information there. Now, I want to just touch base on um, four flight subscriptions themselves. They start for Canadians at 139. Um, work your way up to, to a higher subscription level. It really depends what type of flying you do. You know, if you're a VFR pilot in Canada flying mostly domestically, then the Basic Plus a subscription will do just fine. It gives you all the charts and weather planning and filing capabilities that all the other subscriptions have and that you need. Um, if you're flying a little more, something more advanced, um, you know, turbine engine and up, I would definitely recommend, and you're flying high, high, hard IFR, I would definitely recommend taking a look at Pro Plus or Performance Plus subscription in, in that case. So just something to keep in mind. Um, as I mentioned, we're always kind of working on uh, making the product better, especially for Canadian pilots, because we often get uh, get forgotten in the whole sequence of events that happens in Texas. But uh, that's what I'm here for, and that's what our, my partners are here for, uh, to make sure that we don't get forgotten and that uh, can, 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 Canadian pilots are still uh, getting all the benefits that American pilots are. How can we help? If you ever have any questions, I don't know why the M is cut off there, but <laughs> team at fourflight.com. Uh, not.co is uh, where you can find us. If you just send us an email, uh, one of our pilot support team members will be happy to reply to you. Um, we are all pilots on the pilot support team um, because we need to be. We need to understand the issues and uh, what uh, what pilots are experiencing. So uh, definitely shoot us an email if you have any questions. There are some great resources we have. If you're already a ForeFlight user, uh, go into Documents, Drives on ForeFlight. We have a bunch of guides there that can guide you through um, uh, either finding a, a description of a feature or anything like that. We come up with a lot of videos as well, and we have a blog post that we update regularly. So if you uh, if you have some time or if you just want to look something up, those are great resources there. 
again, it's team at fourflight.com. Uh, I don't know why the M's are getting cut off, but uh, I think that's pretty straightforward there. So, uh, anyways, I want to thank Copa so much for having us. And uh, again, we're just here to educate and inform. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, send us an email. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have too much time for questions today, but uh, we'll be happy to follow up. So, thank you, Sharon, for for organizing and uh, Copa for having us. Fantastic. Thanks very much for that short presentation, Dominic. I did a quick uh, look over. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to challenge this group here to uh, post any questions uh, in the chat, and I'll, I'll redirect it to Dominic after via email. Uh, and it was team at foreflight.com, right? <laughs> Yes, got it. Yeah, uh, and good. and I really did like that uh, mention of the uh, filing for, uh, within Canada uh, webinar series. Very very informative. So for those who are looking for more information on Forflight, uh, uh, they there's a lot of meat in those presentations. So thank you again, Dominic. Um, really appreciate your time here. Uh, and yeah, not a problem. We'll, we'll send you back uh, out out of the digital world <laughs> into. Uh, <laughs> Uh, onto your next journey. Appreciate your time. I see some questions. I, I'll I'll um, I'll definitely capture them and send it over to Dominic. Okay. Awesome. Please do. Yeah, and we uh, we'll see you again sometime soon for sure. Okay. Thanks so much. All righty. So uh, yes, Verna, Forflight is a great app. Um, so now onto the main presentation. Uh, of course, you all know Peter Campbell, our Director of External Relations, who has led many, many of our presentations. Uh, we also have Phil Lightstone here. So for those who are wondering who this gentleman is, uh, you might see his name very often in our, our Copa Flight magazine um, all over. So he, he he's given sage advice. He was also at our first virtual fly-in in the summer uh, on a very similar topic. So. Why don't we get started with that presentation? I know that you'll both be introducing yourself. Uh, so let's kick that off. All righty, let's rock and roll. Phil, do you wanna crank up the bubble machine? Oh, Phil, I think your mic's um, playing around with you. So as you're doing that, I'll uh, start your presentation here. Okay, there we go. Yeah. All right, folks, welcome to tonight's uh, brilliant presentation entitled Buying Your First Aircraft. I think you will find it riveting, and it's about the journey to own an aircraft. And maybe your first one, maybe not. The goal of the presentation tonight is to provide you all with uh, both pilots and owners with an appreciation of the process of buying a general aviation aircraft. We'll be covering many aspects of uh, this uh, process and helping you make the right decision. There will be time for questions and answers at the end. So if you don't mind, uh, hold your questions till then. And certainly if you, I know Sharon's doing an awesome job with um, managing the chat. So uh, we'll just continue going uh, onward to the next slide. It's uh, my sincere pleasure to introduce Phil Lightstone tonight. Um, Phil started his passion for aviation beginning with building balsa wood and tissue covered rubber band model airplanes a long time ago. These got bigger over time and progressed to, to control line and then model rockets and even radio controlled model aircraft, what we might call drones today. While working for a computer software company across the street from the Buttonville Municipal Airport, Phil began working on his private pilot license back in 1994. Today he owns a beautiful uh, 1998 Commander 114B, as you can see in the bottom right corner, uh, in partnership for the last 11 years, and Phil knows an awful lot about aircraft total cost of ownership. Oops, let me just jump back here, sorry. Um, Phil's formal education is in finance, graduating from the University of Toronto, which a Bachelor of Commerce. He certainly is well suited to discussing tonight's topic, essentially the economics of aircraft ownership. In addition to his journalism efforts, Phil has also created and presented a variety of aviation technology presentations for groups such as the 99s, Transport Canada, 
and the Experimental Aviation Association, and he's a regular contribut contributor to our Copa magazine. Phil, welcome. I think Phil's on mute. Because we're not hearing you, bud. Uh, I can see that he's not on mute. Let's try this again. Might be having some technical issues. So as we see, I'm going to come back on here as we um, as we let Phil test that out. We, with very okay. glamorous shot of you, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> Where was that taken? Uh, I'm not exactly sure, to be honest with you. Oh, it was, must be a, a lifetime ago, past uh, pre-COVID time. So what was life right. fun? Yeah, I know. So, uh, Phil, have we got a one, two, three out of you yet? I think what I'll do just to keep things going is I'm going to introduce myself. Sure. Uh, as you know, I'm the uh, Director of External Relations for COPA. My background is uh, pretty heavy on the military side of things. I am uh, graduated of uh, RMC several years ago with a Bachelor of Military Arts and Science. Before that, a uh, aeronautical engineering technology diploma from Seneca College. I spent a little over 32 years in the Canadian Armed Forces as a pilot. I was a commanding officer of a frontline flying unit on a couple of occasions, conducting military operations on three continents. I've got jet and helicopter time. Uh, in abundance and also spent the last uh, 11 years as a class two flight instructor at the Ottawa Flying Club. Uh, I've been very busy uh, supporting aviation in a variety of uh, civilian focused roles. Uh, I was the CFI and, G and G GM of the Ottawa Flying Club most recently before I started with COPA. I'm also now a member of the Prince Edward Flying Club in uh, Prince Edward County. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump on here and go with that, do that. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Phil. Um, and hopefully, Phil, are you, how are you doing there, bud? I think he's going to uh, exit and then come back. So okay. good old right. technology, and, and we'll see you in a quick minute. So Phil is, uh, as we said, is very accomplished. He has uh, written many articles for COPA. He has a very cool uh, line of uh, uh, products called Plain Talk and Plain Investments. Uh, if you're a reader of the Copa magazine, you've probably read many of his articles. He's been doing it for over 10 years. Uh, he was uh, contributed back when, when the magazine was in its newspaper, newspaper format, and he has been writing articles about trips and aviation for some time. Uh, he really has... Uh, brought a lot to bear into the plain tech uh, discussions and we love his articles and uh, he's he's broadened that this year into a thing called plain investments focus on the economics of general aviation uh, I will I will make a shameless plug for his podcast called plain tech first launch in July 2019 and now has over 70 episodes Presenta this presentation is the second in the series. His first was called Total Cost of Ownership, or TCO, and it prepared you for the realities of owning an aircraft, whether it's an ultralight glider, piston aircraft, or for those of you with deeper pockets, a very light jet. Uh, like IT, aviation has a lot of three-letter acronyms, and Phil's very good at them. If you didn't make it to our virtual fly-in back in June, you can find his COPA or presentation on the COPA websites. Today's presentation focuses on the journey to acquire your first airplane. We'll have two guests as part of tonight's uh, presentation. We'll talk about their personal experiences in purchasing an aircraft this year. Now, just to be clear, Phil is not a professional accountant, lawyer, or aircraft broker, but he has owned, rented, and been a block timer for the last 25 years. So I would say he's eminently qualified to talk about this subject. And he's interviewed a number of pilots during the course of researching the plane investment articles. And one pilot who flies at 172 told her, him, sorry, that she doesn't want to know about the price of her airplane it's costing her. Her aircraft has become part of her life, balancing other financial responsibilities. 
Can you hear me now, Pete? Loud and clear, sir. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you so much for pitch hitting pesky uh, technology. Um, uh, before you start the journey to own an aircraft, think about a 360 degree look, look around. Why do I want to own an airplane? As you heard from the previous uh, presentation on total cost of ownership, there are significant costs to owning, owning an aircraft. The acquisition costs are just the beginning, followed by monthly and annual costs. If you're flying less than 75 hours a year, you might consider renting from a flight school or arranging block time from, one of, uh, from an owner or one of your buddies. That's if you have budgetary constraints. I mean, think about the missions that you'll fly and how they'll change over the course of time. Most airplanes that I've rented were old and tired airplanes. Me mechanically, they were top notch, at least I like to think they were, but the air avionics were original. The seats had lost some of their charm. These were revenue generating aircraft designed to work for their life. As a renter, I always treated the aircraft with respect, just like I owned it. I think that other pilots, perhaps not the norm, were not so kind uh, with these airplanes. Uh, I would find all kinds of trash and litter in the, in the aircraft left by the previous renter, including a 20 that must have fallen out of, uh, out of a pocket. Owning an aircraft creates a level of predictability that renting just can't offer. The same avionics, knobs, buttons, and switches all in the same place from flight to flight. That level of familiarization creates muscle memory which is challenging to create uh, from a rental uh, aircraft. Now, block time is uh, a, bit, a bit different. It's about flying the same aircraft all the time. One of my fly, flying buddies in the Buttonville Flying Club, a former member of the RCAF, and thank you for your service, had the opportunity to have the keys to three different aircrafts that he could fly. Each was different, but with his military experience, it wasn't really a big deal. But I think that he's the exception to the average GA pilot. For those building hours, owning an aircraft like a Cessna 172 or Piper Warrior with two or, th or three partners provides a cost-effective way to building uh, ratings like your IFR and commercial ratings. I think that the average GA pilot takes many years to obtain more ratings and build experience. With partners and uh, an own aircraft flying two to 300 hours per year, the cost per hour exclusive of fuel will drop considerably versus renting. Essentially, you're removing the profit which the flight school has built into their hourly rates. That old joke about how do you become a billion, uh, how do you become a millionaire in aviation? Well, you start as a billionaire. It's not that far off. However, depending upon timing, uh, your aircraft may appreciate in value. The 2021 marketplace for used aircraft has seen mark, uh, aircraft prices rise significantly, fueled, uh, I believe, by COVID-19. The crystal ball question is, will prices come back to pre-COVID-19 uh, uh, norms uh, anytime, anytime soon? Thanks, Phil. So which aircraft? But once you've decided that ownership is for you, you need to select an aircraft make and model. Begin with thinking about your mission and budget. How many people, distance, time, fuel burn will help narrow your search? Fundamentally, this is driving you to weight and balance and operating costs per hour or per knuckle mile. For me, 10% of the time I fly by myself. The commander that Phil flies can accommodate four adults with fuel to the tabs in the tanks. A stock commander 114 has about 1,100 pounds of fuel, useful load, and burns about 14 gallons per hour, American gallons, when leaned out. His commander has air conditioning and other beautiful avionics, which make, takes that bird down to a 960 pound useful load. When he bought the aircraft 11 years ago, his kids were teenagers, and now they are older, of course. Uh, and they didn't fly him much. Uh, they didn't fly with him much as much now that they're older. 
Phil's partner's kids were little when they bought the aircraft, so he could put the family full luggage and full fuel and take the family on vacation. 11 years later, his kids are young adults and the numbers have changed. To get a bird with 1,200 pounds of useful load now is a serious upgrade, both in terms of acquisition and operating costs. Really understanding your mission will drive you to the right airplane. Are you looking for a long cross-country cruiser, maybe down to Florida or farther, or that $200 hamburger weekend flyout with the gang? Are you going to be flying in the system, IFR, most of the time? What about your spouse and your kids? Is pressurization needed to keep everyone happy? Do you want to fly in the weather, below 10,000 feet, or above it? Are you a three-season flyer, or are you going to be flying in the winter as well? Remember that flying in the Great Lakes during the wintertime is great, but it's also all about icing. Do you want to be able to punch through that 1,000-foot ceiling and get on top where it's nice and sunny? Do you feel do you, do you feel the need to have flight into known icing, or FIKI for short? Are we talking about a piston, pressurized, or, or turbo, or a turboprop, or even a jet aircraft? These wants and desires are focusing your mind to an aircraft's capabilities and ultimately to costs. Once you've narrowed your search, budget will help reduce the number of aircraft for sale. Are you looking for a fixer upper or uh, and windows and paints? Or do you want something that has factory original avionics and steam gauges, interiors, windows and paints? Are you thinking about maybe investing sweat equity into that fixer upper or does your budget allow you to buy brand new? A little plug about brand new, we all know now that the luxury tax might make that even more expensive. And what's the wait time for that new aircraft? Waco builds eight aircraft a year, and as of Air Venture 2021, they have two slots left in 2022. Speaking with Cessna and Wichita, they can deliver you a new Cessna 182 if you're willing to wait sometime about mid-2023. Yikes! As you narrow your search, each aircraft will have its own personality, or some will say issues. Are all the logbooks complete since manufacture? Jason Zilderbrand, Zilberbrand of VREF believes that a commercial aircraft uh, purchase, 60% of the aircraft's value lies in the logbooks. Lane Field of Brand Aero, located in Brantford, Ontario, there's a lot of pre-purchase inspections, and he sees the logbooks that tell a story about the life of an aircraft and its owners. Did it fly routinely, and where did it fly? An aircraft spending the last five years in Arizona may sound like it won't have corrosion, but if it spent the previous 10 years in Florida, it might be a completely different story. Those of you might not know that I fly an L-29 ex-Czechoslovakian military jet aircraft. Uh, it's a great airplane to fly. It burns 10 liters of jet fuel every minute. Uh, and I have to fly with a flight cushion in order to get uh, able to see out comfortably, especially from the back seat when I'm teaching on it. Like a car, you just don't want to buy an airplane that you haven't flown before. If you're part of a flying club or hang out at, an, at a local airport, hopefully you might be able to fly in a variety of different airplanes. High wing aircraft versus low wing. It's a great starting point for the conversation. Do you physically fit in the aircraft? I'm not all that tall, and both Phil and I are kind of shorter guys, and flying with Cessna 182 with articulating seats means that we may, we may not be able to see over the panel. I do see eye to eye to Phil, and he needs a 4-inch Nelson flight cushion to be able to fly comfortably in a 182. In fact, a little story about Phil. Uh, when he started his flight training, his buddy Howie would take him flying in his 182. And Phil used that big old Toronto phone book to be able to see out of the cockpit. Interestingly, like the commander he flies was designed by engineers to accommodate a wide variety of body styles, not those tall folks from Kansas. Phil's five foot four inch tall, and the commander fits him like a glove, while his partner is six foot five, and it also fits him like a glove. I think that in, in, uh, it helps Phil's ego to know that he doesn't need to fly a flight cushion or a booster seat or a phone book to fly the commander. 
Not all aircraft types have articulating seats or lumbar support options. And when you're deciding on an aircraft investment, sit in that aircraft, see how it fits. Take it flying if you can and do the same thing in the air. What's it like on takeoff, on landing? Ergonomically, look at comfort in the seat, rudder pedals and heights from your headset to the top of the cabin. These factors all come into play when deciding on an airplane. It may, might make the difference between a sale and no sale. Once you've decided on your mission, long cross countries versus $200 hamburger, and we've adjusted that $100 hamburger for inflation, Consider your weight and balance, which all revolves around your mission. How much fuel? How many people? How much baggage? What's the fuel burn? For us older pilots, how long are those cross-country legs or other things? Two hours or four hours? As we age, we know that uh, sometimes the old bladder might need to be made happy a little sooner than four hours. Who you're flying with, and are they all okay with you pulling over or pulling out <laughs> a red Johnny? Personally, Phil's bladder is like a camel. He could easily surpass the fuel's duration, and 11, 11 years later, well, maybe not so much anymore. From an operating cost perspective, total fuel cost could represent about one half of the total annual fixed costs. And again, depending on how much you fly the aircraft. Proper leaning and engine settings are critical to managing fuel costs. This is where a good engine monitoring system and fuel flow gauges come in handy. An electric electronic graphic engine analyzer monitor system like an Insight G3 or G4 comes in very handy. Example, the commander that Phil owns burns 24 gallons per hour at full throttle, full prop fine, and full rich during takeoff. But once you settle down a cruise, that number drops almost in half to 13 and a half gallons per hour at lower altitudes and 11, at 11 gallons per hour at 11,000 feet, seriously different. Safety concerns are always priority on my list. Uh, ballistic recovery sh rescue chutes created aircraft parachute systems decades ago and collaborated with Cirrus for their CAPS system. Cirrus took a big step and was the first aircraft manufacturer to include a parachute in a G airplane, revolutionary at the time. I think the CAP system combined with their automotive inspired interior designs, which are beautiful, helped catapult them into selling more than 8,000 airplanes. Don't forget to include your significant other into that process of buying. Ideally, they'll be flying with you a lot. And remember, after all, happy spouse, happy house. Buy a new versus a used Cirrus is all about your pocketbook. A friend of mine recently sold his 1981 Cessna 182RG and is upgrading to a beautiful 2016 Cirrus SR22T. Gorgeous. Technically, the two airplanes are completely different. And at $650,000 Canadian, he did find his uh, dream come true with four other like-minded pilots, forming a cost-effective partnership. His new airplane even has that new car smell, which probably helped convince his spouse that the upgrade was a good move. When you finally got the right aircraft, try to make a dispassionate decision. It's hard, but it's what you want to do. It's easy to get emotionally overwhelmed in the moment and make a decision based upon looks. More to come about that later. Phil? Okay, thanks, Pete. Um, so the the uh, the kind of the hunt be begins. Uh, here's a, a quick uh, table about how many airplanes are in, in Canada right now. Uh, uh, year end December thirty first, twenty twenty. There's three thousand uh, thirty six thousand nine hundred and eighteen aircraft. Interestingly, thirty four thousand of them are in the GA and uh, BA business aviation. Uh, uh, class with only 2,159 uh, in the big boy status, for lack of a better word, uh, weighing over 12,500 pounds. So clearly, uh, you know, clearly the quantity of aircraft are in the uh, in the GA uh, side. That's right. And, and a lot of them are and a lot of them are COPA members. Exactly. And, and 
uh, again, these numbers are courtesy of our friends at uh, Transport, Transport Canada. Well, w once you've decided uh, on your make and model, as, as Pete mentioned earlier, like for example, uh, a Cessna 172M model, the hunt will begin. And it's best to start your search closer to home and then expand the search to other provinces or the United States. Uh, when you're on a fly out for that $200 hamburger, check out the airport's bulletin board. There's usually some flyers uh, with folks selling their aircraft or looking for partners or offering block time. The closer to home, the less complex the pre-purchase process will, uh, will be. Simplicity usually translates into a less expensive total acquisition price, inclusive of pre-purchase uh, inspection, test flights, avionics review, etc. If you've exhausted the bulletin board approach, don't forget there are a lot of online resources like brokers, trade -a plane controller, ASO.com, barn, barn stormers, and the type-specific clubs. And don't forget about COPA's Canada Trade a Plane. With, the, uh, with it being a seller's marketplace, COPA has found aircraft ads, uh, if you can believe it, on Kijiji. Let's face it, there's roughly 37,000 registered uh, 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 aircraft in Canada, which makes for slim pickings. Most of the websites have filter and sort capabilities, Trade a plane just recently uh, reports 122 Canadian registered aircraft for sale on their website. Ideally, finding a Canadian aircraft will reduce the time from search to flying your first flight by completely avoiding the Transport Canada import and FAA export process. The FAA process is not too difficult, but it, it, it is more about paperwork. However, the Canadian import process adds significant costs to uh, acquisition of your uh, new airplane. Once you, uh, uh, once you own the aircraft, you have to remove uh, the November registration, if we're talking about an imported aircraft, and put on uh, your new Canadian registration. Once the November registration is removed, which could involve paint stripping, sanding, painting, the new registration could either be painted on or applied with a decal. The size of the lettering may be a factor depending on where you intend to fly. For example, the Bahamas requires 12 inch numbers and uh, letters, 30 uh, centimeters, and uh, letters uh, uh, on both the fuselage uh, and uh, on the wing. Once you've found the seller, the next question is what's the right price to pay for your new chariot. A good starting point is the VREF aircraft valuation tool. As a COPA member benefit, the tool is available to COPA members free of charge. When using the tool, there's a lot of information that you need to input into the tool. Uh, knowing the year, model, total time on engine and airframe, types of avionics, condition of interior, and exterior will start the uh, valuation process. Essentially, the tool is using a series of pluses and minuses to determine value. Don't forget that uh, VREF and other uh, tools spit out valuations in US dollars. If you're buying a Canadian aircraft, will the seller do the transaction in Canadian dollars? Is the aircraft advertised in Canadian dollars or US? Exchange rate fluctuations will cause uh, the final price to change. Ideally, finding an aircraft uh, in Canada will end up being more cost effective, especially now during a seller's marketplace. Okay, next slide. Well, when we start to look at the financial components of total cost of ownership, they fall into three broad broad. Um, uh, broad brush uh, buckets, uh, acquisition costs, fixed costs, and operating costs, or the, the costs uh, when you fly the airplane. The numbers in this presentation uh, are used as examples and are for a Cessna 172. They will vary based upon the specifics of your aircraft as well as your uh, geographic location. 
Currently, uh, as I said earlier, we are in a seller's marketplace with aircraft values appreciating significantly. And we're, we'll hear a little bit more about that later. Great if you're at the end of your flying career and you're selling, bad if you're buying. Many owners uh, will include in their hourly operating costs, engine, propeller, avionics, and maintenance reserves. It's like saving for a rainy day when, when you'll have uh, a one-time large capital expenditure like overhauling uh, your engine. Don't forget to include taxes into, uh, into your number. And of course, this is going to vary based upon your province. You may want to include uh, uh, in your reserve fund money for unexpected costs. Over the past uh, five years, we've been talking about ADSB requirements for those of us who fly across the border to the uh, United States. In 2020, the federal uh, government on the Canadian side uh, enacted legislation requiring 406 ELTs to be installed in all Canadian aircraft. Uh, there are a few exceptions, of course. And depending upon your aircraft, this could cost uh, as much as $2,000 uh, or, or, or more. Again, uh, talking about a general aviation aircraft. And don't forget about that pesky luxury task, tax that Pete uh, mentioned uh, earlier. And again, a little more to come on that. And finally, we never really know when the FAA or Transport Canada will come out with a new airworthiness directive. Think of those as extraordinary uh, costs. Some may be uh, financially inconsequential, and others may, uh, may be very expensive, both in terms of the, uh, uh, of the aircraft uh, not flying and, of course, the, the actual uh, money. Okay, so we're talking about it, so let's go a little farther down the financial ownership path, and that is aircraft, aircraft acquisition. Purchasing a Canadian aircraft should, as we've said, have a lower cost of acquisition versus importing an airplane from the U.S. or even further away, that's to say overseas. Typically, aircraft are valued in U.S. dollars and most Canadians' income, of course, is generated in Canadian dollars. We know that uh, currently foreign exchanges are running about 20% difference between Canadian and American dollars, and so that will impact the final cost of your airplane. Once you've decided on a specific aircraft make, model, and year, the number crunching can be win. The graphic you see here illustrates that the cost of the aircraft itself is just one part of the total cost and could be as much as 75% of the final acquisition costs. That is the larger pale blue uh, part of the pie. But there are lots of other costs associated with buying an airplane and these may fluctuate based upon time. As we said, foreign exchange is a great example. Don't forget other costs like ferrying the aircraft to your home airport and legal title searches, lien services, escrow service costs, depending on whether you're buying a $28,000 Cessna 152 that I mentioned that aircraft pricing has gone up or a $650,000 SR-22, you may need these extra professional services. Critical to the acquisition process and so critical is a pre-purchase inspection. This will help you understand if you should go ahead with the purchase, remember, a dispassionate decision, and the cost of repairing any issues with the airplane. Again, an eyes wide open understanding of future repair and maintenance costs is highly desirable. It is a process to keep the seller honest. Are all of his, her representations correct and accurate? The new, the new luxury tax only applies to newly manufactured aircraft and will increase the financial acquisition cost. And uh, we've just just this week uh, received a bit of information that it is only on new aircraft, but for some reason, and we're going to fight it, is that it, it only applies to new aircraft of 2019 or old or newer. Uh, more to come, more to come. And uh, check out the Plain Investments article in the June edition of the Copa Magazine for more information on that. Phil, is it me? No, it's me. All right. 
So whether you fly, let's just jump the slide here. Whether you fly one or 100 hours per year, the aircraft will incur costs. There is a, there is a lot of these factors which determine the total annual fixed costs. For example, with insurance, the annual premiums will determine will be determined by many factors, including but not limited to the hull value, the number of pilots that are flying it, pre-existing accidents or incidents on that airplane, the make and model of the aircraft, hangered or tied down outside, and the experience and ratings of the pilots that will fly the plane. Over the past two years, we have seen insurance premiums increasing by over 25% and in certain circumstances, doubling that. But that's a separate conversation for another webinar. Costs associated with parking will vary greatly based upon geography and the type of parking that you want for your plane, heated, unheated, indoors, outdoors. There are a number of other factors in subscription-based costs, such as database updates for GPS navigation systems, scheduling software, uh, keeping electronic journey and tech logs, and much more. Some of these fixed costs are, are, of course, discretionary or not required. As an example, if your 172 does not have a panel-mounted instrument flight rule certified GPS navigator, you probably don't need to keep a database subscription. But maybe you want four flight, you know, which can go on your device. Most GA aircraft have an annual inspection, which has a two components. The inspection itself, the AME's costs, and the parts and labor required to execute the findings of the inspection. I like to think of this being a three category uh, process with re regulatory requirements such as searching out and addressing airworthiness directives, preventative maintenance items like brakes and tires, nice to have upgrades like TSO to USB power jacks, and more to come on in future slides. If your aircraft is owned by a corporation rather than personally, there may well be accounting and legal fees as well. Don't forget that costs will increase over time. These are fixed costs. I remember flying in 1995 and before that when 100 low lead fuel was 81 cents per liter. We're not there now. Now we're over $2 in some places and even higher. Phil, I think the ball is back to you, sir. It is. So as you narrow your search, you really uh, need to take, a, a, as Pete mentioned, a dispassionate approach to the process. This will help you have that eyes wide open approach to final, uh, finalizing the right aircraft. Sadly, sometimes there are aircraft out there where the seller uh, has an, excuse the pun, put lipstick on the pig. As you narrow your search down to one or two aircraft, take a good long look at the log books, both the tech logs and the journey logs. Um, are they complete from manufacturing date or are their log books missing? The history of an aircraft is an important consideration. Does it fly routinely or just a few hours a year? Is it an annual? Interestingly, I, Lycoming has a service bulletin for many of their engines stating that the oil sh uh, will be changed every three months, regardless of the hours. I can't emphasize uh, enough that airplanes really like to fly. And it's a bit of an oxymoron for those that haven't owned airplanes before. The more, air the more an airplane flies, the less maintenance is needed. A flying couple uh, of mine, uh, a flying couple I know, um, stopped flying their Cessna 172. Uh, but they really believed in this, this idea that airplanes like the, to fly. They allowed a mutual friend to fly the airplane, and all he had to do was pay for the fuel. No block time costs. Their goal was to keep the airplane flying. Eventually, they sold uh, the airplane. As an aircraft ages, so do their avionics and their um, electronic components. Over a long period of time, they may need uh, either board-level repairs or to be replaced. As I said earlier, logbooks tell a story about a, uh, an aircraft. During a pre-purchase inspection, uh, Brant uh, Arrow of Brantford, Ontario, will spend a lot of time reviewing the logbooks. Where is the airplane being flown? 
An airplane spending the last five years in Arizona sounds like a great airplane from a corrosion perspective. It's in a dry climate. But perhaps upon further review of the logbooks, uh, you find out that during the previous 10 years, it was in Miami. Maybe not such a good place from a corrosion perspective. It's not to say that aircraft that aircraft should be discounted. Just be financially prepared in the event that the aircraft uh, develops corrosion during your uh, stewardship. Another thing to look at during the review is staple holes. That might suggest some paperwork has been removed to uh, hide repairs. If the airplane has had uh, one over uh, one owner during its life, the conversation's a little simpler. Does the aircraft have damage history and how old is the history? What is the quality of the repairs? These are all uh, examples of things which impact value. What about bad karma or red flags during the process? For example, you arrange to buy uh, an aircraft beginning with a test flight. You travel to the airport, perhaps in the United States, only to find out that the owner doesn't have insurance on the aircraft and hasn't flown it in eight months. Do you go for the test flight or do you walk away from the pur purchase? The dispassionate approach allows you to step back, think, and possibly walk or run away. Another friend of mine buying a Mooney during the test flight with the owner had a catastrophic engine failure. Fortunately, they were overhead the airport at the time, the prop stop. Dead sticking the Mooney in, they made the runway without incident. Well, my buddy bought the airplane, uh, less the cost of a, an overhaul. He felt this was good karma, allowing him to start flying the aircraft with uh, a newly overhauled engine. Aircraft times are another factor. Ideally, an aircraft which flies 200 to 300 hours a year versus one that flies five. A low time engine where the overhaul was done over a decade ago might not be that attractive. Okay, next slide. Well, as Pete said earlier, we can't um, emphasize a pre-purchase, the importance of a pre-purchase in inspection. Sadly, you just can't buy an aircraft on a handshake and take it for granted that the seller is being 100% honest with you. Or maybe the other sellers, the previous owners of the aircraft, did not divulge maintenance issues. In other words, take the, represent, the representations with a grain of salt and verify. This starts with paperwork. When your search has found your new chariot, place it under contract using an aircraft purchase agreement, especially now during a seller's marketplace. There are a number of, of uh, buying guard, guides and contracts on COPA's uh, member website. At the end of the presentation, uh, there's a bunch of handy uh, links that we've documented for you. The issue for first time buyers is like many things in life, you don't know what you don't know. What does a pre-purchase inspection cover and what does it not? Beginning, begin by finding a reputable shop, ideally not the shop that's done the last few annuals or maintenance on the aircraft. You're looking for an unbiased, eyes wide open view of the aircraft. Most avi uh, maintenance shops don't do avionics and, uh, and will focus on the logbooks, airframe, and engine during their um, pre-purchase inspection. There are a few shops who are airframe and avionics shops like uh, Brantero. Uh, a lot of times determining the quality and fitness of a uh, avionics requ uh, requires test flying the aircraft. Who's going to do that? There is a presumption that the purchaser organizing the pre-purchase inspection knows what he or she is looking for. After all, not uh, all maintenance shops are created equal. Perhaps for a Cessna or a Piper, that's true. But when you're looking at more esoteric aircraft, the shop needs to have a lot of experience on make and model. This is critical to ensuring that you have a detailed inspection and understand what you're buying into. More specifically, how much you're going to invest into the aircraft's past, uh, uh, into the aircraft past the purchase price. Is the aircraft a fixer upper or in pristine shape? What's the condition of the avionics and other systems like air conditioning? 
air conditioning is interesting uh, in that few GA aircraft have it. Not until you get into a much larger air aircraft will you see these types of environmental systems. The pre-purchase inspection should include a test flight, ideally with a flight instructor who has time on tight. The test flight has two objectives. Test all the avionics, gauges, switches, and the autopilot. Is everything working as it uh, should be? A great example would, would be to have the autopilot coupled to the navigation hardware flying approach. If at all possible, consider making a test flight checklist where you can methodically test each system and make notes of your findings. Probably best to have the instructor fly the aircraft as you set up all the avionics. During the test flight, there's a lot of things happening. Fly the plane while attempting to make notes about the results. Could be a bit tough. Uh, if you're a professional test pilot like Chuck Yeager or Bob Hoover, uh, probably not a big deal. However, for us low time GA pilots, low time relatively speaking, uh, and we're not trained to deal with uh, the test environment. Having two pilots in the cockpit to conduct the test flight should have a, a higher quality result. Again, the goal is to come back with a list of an, um, anomalies. You can turn the results over to your mechanics or the avi avionics shop to get an estimate of the costs to resolve these, uh, these items. Well, if you're a neophyte to buying an aircraft uh, or the aircraft is far away from home, like in the US, you might consider Savvy Aviation's pre-buy service. The service is delivered in three phases. The pre-purchase inspection is not uh, designed to be an annual inspection. As a reminder, the annual inspection has two components, the inspection and, as Pete mentioned, the remediation of items found during the inspection. The annual inspection typically begins with a review of the logbooks, airworthiness directives, and service bulletins. Savvy's um, first phase is designed to help you narrow down to one uh, aircraft, uh, and it's a free service. They'll do a cursory review of a bunch of aircraft that uh, you send them, narrowing down to one or two. This is done through reviewing the logbooks and re reviewing the pre-purchase agreement or the sales agreement that, uh, that you have between you and the seller. The first phase, as I mentioned, has, has no cost. It's uh, really designed to narrow down the search and get you to a point where you're uh, seriously thinking of executing a pre-purchase agreement and putting the aircraft under con contract. During a seller's marketplace, this is a critical step to ensure that another buyer doesn't swoop in and buy the aircraft out from under you. Once you've narrowed your search to one aircraft, the next phase uh, does an, uh, uh, an in-depth review of the logbooks and finds an unbiased maintenance shop to do the pre-purchase inspection. Savvy Aviation has a large number of maintenance shops in their databases, many of which they have a working experience with. This helps align you with a high quality maintenance shop with experience on the type of aircraft that you're buying. They'll contact the shop and determine if they have the time to work your pre-purchase inspection into their calendar. Working with the maintenance shop, Savvy uh, will do a progressive pre-purchase inspection designed to stop the process if there are any major red flags that would deliver a no-go decision. The end result is a report which outlines the shop's findings of the pre-purchase inspection and the costs to remediate the issues uh, with that aircraft. You can then go back to the seller with the report in hand and negotiate the final uh, purchase price. During the process, Savvy will coach you through the final negotiations with the seller. The approach is designed to provide you with an eyes wide open view of the aircraft using unbiased resources. Service costs $750 uh, US for a single engine piston aircraft, $1,000 for a twin, $1,500 US for a turboprop single, and $2,000 for a turbojet um, single engine aircraft. Uh, check out uh, the details of the service on Savvy's uh, uh, website. 
Phil, that sounds that sounds like an invaluable service, and that price is unbelievably cheap. If you don't mind me saying, that's that's a, mm. that's fantastic. All right, let's talk about logbooks. We've talked a lot about them, but let's talk a little bit more about them. As we said before, they tell a story about the history of the aircraft, and uh, we can find out a lot about from that history. Has it been flying regularly, or is it that? what we call a hangar queen, that way, you know, maybe polished and sat in the corner for far too long. A low time aircraft that's 60 years old might not be as attractive as an aircraft that flew every week. How often has it flown in the last five or 10 years? As we said before, where has it been operating out of and how much service was done? Was it the bare minimum manual or is it a well-maintained aircraft? How do we know that? Well, we know it because that's what's in the log books. Does the aircraft have any damage history? If it does, who did the repairs and what was the quality of the work done? As we know in Canada, log books, unlike in the States, fall into two types, the journey log and the technical logs. The journey log is carried by the pilot in the aircraft whenever it goes flying, where the pilot records details about each flight. Pilots, mechanics, and aviation shops record their maintenance actions and information in the in the journey logs, but also in the technical logs, comprising a series of log books that are divided into airframe, engine and propeller, and possibly modifications as well. The technical logs stay typically on the ground, and a lot of pilot owners have decided to have their mechanics keep the technical logs. Not my personal choice, but there you go. Canadian aircraft tend to have a lot of details in their log books, and American aircraft, very differently, have a single logbook. They tend not to record every individual flight conversely to the Canadian requirements. This brings up some interesting dichotomies during pre-purchase inspections and logbook reviews of an American aircraft. It can be a little harder and more difficult to figure out the frequency of flights and the geography of those flights. Bit of a hint comes from the maintenance records and geograph geography can be worked out as a result, but still not the same. Part of the value, however, of the aircraft is in these logbooks, as we've said previously. And if some, or worst case, all other than the most recent are lost or stolen, then the value of the aircraft can be significantly reduced. Joseph Zilberbrand, president of VREF, who we talked about earlier, Aircraft valuation reports, and I think it's a conservative estimate, that the aircraft values can be diminished by up to 60% if all the logs are missing. And we can see why. If, moreover, if the aircraft is commercially registered, the logbooks are critical to working out the final cost of the aircraft. Have all of the aircraft airworthiness directors be complied with? How do we know if we don't have the books? The only way to know in that case is... Get the log books or execute the airworthiness directives as part of the purchase agreement, which can get quite expensive. Log books therefore become a very important part of determining the time remaining on time sensitive aircraft components, such as magnetos, fuel and oil hoses, propellers, ELT batteries, just to name a few. If some of the log books are missing, then you can either change the part or spend the time acting as a Cluzo inspector and trying to piece together the puzzle of the paperwork to determine when that part was installed and how many hours are left. A great example would be magnetos. In a certified aircraft, the magnetos must be inspected and repaired every 500 hours. If part of the logbooks are missing and there is not a record of when each magneto was inspected, then you would be required to respect, inspect and repair both, depending on what's missing. Depending on the type of mag, this could be at least 900 bucks per. It becomes a question of when do you need to spend the money in order to be compliant with the regulations. Propellers are another interesting topic when we're talking about U.S. aircraft being ported into Canada. We have a 10-year prop inspection and overhaul rule, disassembly inspection and possibly repair, depending on the type of prop, while the aircraft, while the Americas take a more lazy fair approach. Example, a 12 year old aircraft being imported into Canada may require, because of our regulations, a prop removal inspection and overhaul. And this could easily add up to $3,000 per blade 
plus the cost of the import. There is a move towards electronic logbooks. These are great. The process, however, begins with scanning the paper logbooks and then using technology to record each flight. Record records for maintenance work as well as all the parts, all of the parts and documentation can be added to the system. Reminders can be set up for time sensitive art activities like oil changes or magneto inspections. Check out Airbly or Airbly and Plain Logics who offer electronic logbooks. And by the way, COPA members have a membership discount with Airbly. All right, let's jump ahead one more slide. Insurance. Uh, there we go. All right. Well, hopefully that's not your airplane in the picture. Annual insurance premiums are one of the top five fixed annual aircraft costs and vary greatly. There are many variables that impact the annual premium. Typically, insurance costs can be between one and a half to four percent of the haul value of the aircraft. Which isn't bad, actually. The premium process begins with the haul value, but doesn't stop there. If you have an aircraft where the insurance company decides to write off the airplane, you'll get a check for the policy's haul value. Aircraft are typically written off when the repair cost exceeds the haul value. Don't forget, too, to include taxes, delivery, and importation costs into that haul value. Uh, that is if you're intending to replace the aircraft when it's written off, should that ever happen. You should consider updating the value of the aircraft during the insurance renewal process, especially in today's aircraft climate hot market, where we see aircraft sale prices climbing. With most aircraft transactions and in U.S. dollars, you should also use today's current exchange rate when calculating that hull value. Let's also not forget that in Canada, there are also requirements for liability insurance. With Canadian policies, the premiums are in Canadian dollars, as is the hull value. COPA is recommending that good quality aircraft covers, and so are our insurance companies, be used to protect the aircraft from, from environmental damages with the goal of reducing insurance costs. The Magnus Group, our insurance partners at COPA, is finding that damage to aircraft while parked on the ground and not hangered is and can be very significant. Uh, aircraft interiors as well as avionics are more susceptible to wear and tear based on ultraviolet heat and sunlight. And we should also be cognizant of hail and ice damage for tie down aircraft. There is, interestingly, a Canadian company called Aero Covers uh, near Aurelia that uh, makes a variety of aircraft covers, including wing, tail, intake plugs, canopy, and engine covers. And they do have a full aircraft cover, uh, wing covers at least, that can protect against hail damage. And while insulated engine covers allow engine preheaters to be more effective during those sub-zero Canadian winters, especially if you're be parked outside. Uh, we've seen insurance premiums increase recently by over 25%, and in, circumstances, in certain circumstances, as much as double in the past few years. Let's not forget that as we age and the aircraft, uh, as the pilots age, the, uh, the aircraft seems to be impacted by insurance premiums. Today, some pilots are more concerned about if they can get insurance rather than the cost, but again, that's a conversation for another webinar. Don't forget COPA's VIP insurance program run by the Magnus Group and COPA's Guide on Insurance, which can be downloaded anytime from our members section. Okay, it's over over to me. And I just want to, uh, just to mention that the savvy pricing uh, does not include the cost of the pre-purchase inspection Conducted by the uh, maintenance shop. I didn't want. Uh, I didn't want that uh, that lost. Once you've decided to move forward with the uh, purchase and you've finalized the purchase price of the aircraft, the next step is to close the transaction. Depending on the specifics of the purchase, did you buy it from a friend or a complete stranger? You may take a different uh, approach to this step. Ideally, you should engage a lawyer to complete the necessary paperwork for the transaction. Also, um, a lawyer can act as an escrow agent 
to hold the funds until the transaction is completed. A critical step is to do a lien search. And uh, for U.S. aircraft, this is uh, much easier than for Canadian aircraft. American liens are required to be registered with the FAA, making the search much simpler. In Canada, liens are not uh, registered with Transport Canada. Canadian liens are registered in the province that the uh, work was done in, for example. Here's where logbooks become important. They will have a complete history of who and where the work was done on the aircraft. This narrows down the number of provinces and territories for uh, lien search. Uh, you can check out ppsa.ca, which is a handy website to conduct lien searches on. You want to ensure that your lawyer or escrow agent distributes the funds uh, from your payment to the lien holder and receives a lien uh, discharge, essentially delivering a financially clean aircraft to you. Sometimes air, uh, aircraft brokers will provide closing services, but you need to ask yourself, who is their client, you or the seller? Engaging a lawyer or an aircraft service ensures that you're the client and that the provider has a fiduciary responsibility uh, to you. It's all about protecting you, uh, in essence. There are a number of online escrow services making the delivery of the service seamless. However, aircraft transactions are a bit different than buying a, an exotic used Lamborghini. Check out Aero Title, who are bonded and insured in the event of any hiccups, and they focus on aircraft. Once the paperwork and process is determined, the next question is where to take delivery of the aircraft. For Canadian registered aircraft staying in Canada, the process is much simpler. Ideally, the transaction could be closed in the city, province, in which the pre-purchase uh, was conducted. That's assuming that the aircraft is still with the shop that did the pre-purchase inspection. If not, uh, you not only have the logistics of bringing your new chariot home, but also the tax implications as uh, total GST, HST uh, varies between provinces. Also time of year plays a factor. Are you uh, a resident in Ontario and your new aircraft is in Vancouver? A trip uh, across Canada during the winter can have its own challenges, especially if you're a VFR rated pilot with no time on tight. You should have your insurance decisions made prior to closing. Once the aircraft is yours, it needs to be insured. Imagine if it was uninsured for a few days, during which time a thunderstorm comes through delivering hail damage to your aircraft. Not a good day. Ideally, ensure that you have insurance in place the day of the closing, or even better, the day before. Also ensure that the seller has insurance place uh, in place prior to closing. Do you have the legal obligation to close if the aircraft is damaged? Hopefully your per, uh, purchase agreement has language outlining who holds the risk uh, during the time prior to closing. Importing a U.S. or other foreign aircraft uh, into, into Canada is not necessarily for the faint of heart. There are a large number of steps, beginning with deregistering deregi the aircraft with the FAA, as an example. Obviously, an unregistered aircraft can't be flown. Can you get a ferry permit to, uh, to bring your airplane home? I think that it's much easier to import an American aircraft into Canada if it's sitting at a Canadian airport, ideally your home airport. The trick is to get the American seller to fly the aircraft to Canada for the pre-purchase inspection uh, or the closing. Sometimes American sellers can be a little skittish about the border, especially during these uncertain COVID-19 times. Transport Canada's and the FAA's website, websites have uh, a wealth of information about the import-export process, as does COPA and AOPA. Ideally, the shop that did your pre-purchase inspection uh, could also look after the import. Needless to say, the devil is in the details. Lastly, uh, do you take the next available Canadian registration or get a custom registration? I always thought it would be fun and cool to have Charlie Foxtrot India Lima Lima. Uh, unfortunately, it's taken. For a small fee, you can reserve a registration mark, which is good for, for one year. 
For a Canadian registered aircraft, and assuming that you're not changing the mark, the registration must be transferred from the seller to the buyer. This is a simple process with Transport Canada and costs $110 Canadian. Simply complete the application on the certificate of registration, which you receive from the seller. Fill out the re application for registration of aircraft, which can be downloaded from Transport Canada's website. Submit the application with proof of ownership and pay the registration fee. While you're waiting for the new CFR to come from Transport Canada, you can use an interim CFR by filling out your name, address, and date on the CFR, which you got from the seller. Keep this document uh, in the aircraft, of course. The in-term uh, CFR is good for, uh, for three months. Okay, next slide. Okay, once you've got delivery of your new aircraft, uh, you're going to want to, to, to start flying uh, the aircraft. And you may find that more maintenance will be required. With your pre-purchase list of squawks, you can decide uh, with guidance from your mechanic uh, what needs to be done now and what can be de uh, deferred. For example, you might have yellowing acrylic navigation covers. Uh, you can probably defer their replacement until next year. But that Magneto with 495 hours on it will, will need to be inspected and repaired now. As you fly the aircraft, more maintenance items may pop up. This is especially true for aircraft that uh, flew a few hours a year. As I said earlier, airplanes like to fly, and airplanes which fly more may have less ongoing maintenance requirements than those hangar queens. There are a lot of consumables uh, in an aircraft like oil, oil filters, spark plugs, hydraulic fluid, brakes, and tires. How do you fly your aircraft also contributes to maintenance. Do you ride the brakes when you taxi? Do you run the engine in cruise flight full rich or lean a peak? Sometimes there are surprises that impact maintenance costs. The Smith Falls Flying Club purchased a Quebec-based low-time Cessna 172M model. The aircraft was purchased at a good price, but was a hangar cream. After flying the aircraft for 100 hours, uh, the engine required overhaul. Well, that was an unexpected $20,000 in costs. With low compressions and burning oil, the engine was speaking to the flying club. Time for an overhaul. When considering an engine overhaul, um, you should spend a lot of time educating yourself. There are so many different types of overhauls from factory brand new engines to factory remanufactured to third party engine shops overhauling your, in, uh, uh, your engine. Sh some shops like Victor Aviation offer a blue printing overhaul where the components of the engine, like the uh, pistons, are matched and balanced, really taking it to the, to the next level. Knowing what is and what is not included in the overhaul is really important. Overhauling the engine is one thing, but what about the accessories like the oil pump, alternator, starter motor, magnetos, spark plugs, fuel hoses, and wiring? A buddy of mine overhauled his uh, Lycoming IO360, but did not replace the oil pump, which was built in 1967. Make a long story short, he ended up overhauling his engine twice in three months. Many uh, maintenance shops uh, offer a firewall forward versus straight overhaul. Depending upon the age of the aircraft, the fuel system may require maintenance. Wet wings may require resealing, while bladders may require replacement. Again, it's just time and money. As the aircraft ages, other components will need to be replaced, like switches and handles, voltage regulators and gauges, just to name a few. My first commander uh, that I had uh, uh, had radios from 1977, which had some plastic uh, components, which became brittle with age. On my very first flight from Florida to the Bahamas, I was pretty nervous and excited, as I turned the radio's frequency memory selector, I heard breaking plastic. For the rest of the flight, I lost the ability to put a frequency into memory. 
wasn't a horrible problem, but you know, uh, it was a problem. Fortunately, uh, at that time, Kitchener Arrow, now Mid Canada Mod Center in Waterloo, Ontario, had the Collins plastic parts. Three dollars and fifty cents for the part. Hundred, I think, one hundred and fifty dollars for the uh, for the labor. <laughs> oh. Ouch! <laughs> Ouch! Is right. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know what they say about uh, if it's an aircraft part, it's more expensive than the same part from somewhere else. I think we're doing well, Phil. Lots of great information here. So, all right, guys and gals, ladies and gentlemen, it's come to that day. It's the day before the first flight. Not the first flight, but the day before the first flight. With the tra transaction closed and your aircraft ferried to your home airport, when the aircraft marks are on, the excitement to fly your new chariot will build tremendously. Unless you have time on type, it's probably a bad idea to jump in, light the fires, kick the tires, and go for your first flight basically unprepared. Ideally, your first flight, kind of like that test flight, should be with an instructor. Your insurance company will probably also dictate how much dual time you will need before you can Take it up by yourself and fly as the PIC. Spend a lot of time with the POH. Imagine yourself kind of on a test flight, like that licensed test flight you did a long time ago. Build your own checklist and have them on your kneeboard, including the emergency checklist. A good friend of Phil's, Natalie Kelly of Fly Girls, bought herself a Vans RV earlier this year. The owner that she bought it off her provided a checklist that was written, I'm not making this up, on the back of the paper bag. Now, home-built aircraft are in a category to themselves. It may come with lots of documentation or next to nothing. Natalie, unfortunately, was transitioning from a newer Piper Archer, beautiful airplane, to the RV. From a certified airplane with lots of licensed documentation to an aircraft, potentially in this case, with next to nothing. To make a long story short, during the second week of ownership, she had to conduct an emergency landing on a road caused by fuel starvation. Luckily, no one was hurt and the aircraft was undamaged. Okay, good. You can listen to her story firsthand on Plane Talk. After reading the POH and building your own checklist and spend time in the aircraft familiarizing yourself with all the switches, buttons, and circuit breakers, Take some time to review the engine starting procedures as well as those emergency checklists. Run through them. Get somebody to quiz you on them. You might consider building a cheat sheet with all the appropriate speeds like BSO, B&E, if it's got landing gear that comes up or down, what the limiting speeds on retraction and extension are, flap speeds, best rate of climb speeds, maneuvering speeds, and if there's one of your type, if there is one of your type of aircraft, and others. Don't forget other details like how much and what type of oil, what the tire pressures are, and what, how much and where the hydraulic fluid goes. Head out to the airport. Do a walk around, ideally undistracted by your buddies, peppering you with questions about your new aircraft. Take the time to familiarize yourself with the walk around and know what's normal and what's not. Know how the oil dipstick is pulled out and put back in and secured. Think about that ground portion of your flight test way back when. On a flight with one of Phil's buddies uh, that landed in Collingwood, Ontario, only to find that the belly of the beautiful airplane of a Cirrus 20 was covered in oil. Unfortunately, the oil cap in the Cirrus had come undone in flight and with the pressure in the cowl sucking out the oil from the dipstick tube, we had a mess. Not good. Fortunately, it was a short flight and only lost about two quarts of oil. Imagine if it had been longer. Consider creating a little weight and balance form, perhaps using an Excel spreadsheet that lets you put in fuel, baggage, and people and weights into a spreadsheet. It can calculate for you if you're overgrowth and where the center of gravity is. Remember, uh, being uh, doing either of those can make your aircraft unworthy because it's we've busted the rules. There are a number of websites and apps that automate this for you. Check out e6bx.com. They have some great weight and balance calculators for a variety of aircraft. You do need to know the basic empty weight, but that should be in the journey log, arm and moments for your aircraft. 
and of course the weights of the people you're going to go flying with. Having flown many airplanes, beautiful flight career that I've had, I can tell you that the butterflies in your gut will become very active during that first flight. Probably one of life's most memorable moments right back to your first solo. But you need to suppress your excitement and treat the flight first flight in a very professional manner. After all, it's your life that you're putting in your hands and that's what we're talking about. See if you can spend some time with the previous owner maybe he or she is around locally, going over the fine details of the specific aircraft, especially things like avionics. How does that GPS work? How do you make that autopilot function? With which, uh, with new aircraft becoming more and more complex, for example, some retractable landing gear will have squat switches, which will set the transponder to alt when you become airborne and turn it to standby automatically when you land. Also, don't forget that there are many software-based avionics simulators that are available to help you learn how to manipulate that piece of avionics from the comfort of your own home. Take your time during the walk around and make sure that you're not distracted. Do try to avoid chatting with the people around you and answering your mobile phone. Like we said earlier, see if the seller is willing to walk you through that first flight together after all, not every airplane is created equal, and uh, same with pilots. I take a high-intensity flashlight with me during that walk around, look in all the areas, and see if there's anything that looks a little weird to you. Uh, inspect the landing gear, look for fasteners and components in the wingtips, like aileron counterweights. With all the appropriate documents in the aircraft, spend some time on the ground with your instructor to discuss the flight plan. Ideally, do something like a biannual flight review, and this will get you proficient with flying the aircraft as well as meeting your regulatory requirements. Practicing flight skills like slow flight, 360 degree turns, both at shallow and steep angles, forced landing glides, stalls, and if appropriate, spins. Flying with your instructor will get you in tune with the airplane while sharpening and refreshing your skills. Before that flight with your instructor, create a checklist for the flight maneuvers. You're flying your retractables, this is the perfect time to test the emergency gear extension system. Typically, this is detailed in the POH, an important document to have ready as opposed to in the trunk of your car or in the back seat. And don't forget about crew resource management. You can fly the aircraft while the instructor handles the radios, avionics, environmental controls, and the flight's checklist. As we said before, and we'll repeat here, know the emergency checklist and the procedures for engine failure during climb out, such as trim to best glide speed, primary and fuel selector on both, fuel pump on, engine restart, maybe. Would you consider turning back to the airport and what altitude would you do that at? FAA uh, simulators tell us that there may be no perfect altitude, better off to land straight ahead. Know your fuel system well and know how much the fuel in the aircraft burns. In our situation with Natalie, we talked about earlier, her panel system was telling her that the fuel burn was four and a half gallons an hour. Well, the engine was in fact an IO360, which typically burns between eight and 10 gallons per hour, depending on how much you lean. Her math was based on four and a half versus 10. Guess what? She ran a fuel in one tank a few miles shy of the airport. On that first flight, consider orbiting around the airport, like the example we talked about earlier, well above circuit altitude as you familiarize yourself with the airplane. It's also one of the safest place to be during an engine failure. Test all those systems of the aircraft, especially the landing gear and retractable. Phil's buddy Jamie was test flying a Mooney he was buying with the owner when the engine suffered a catastrophic failure, like we said. Fortunately, they were 3,000 feet above the airport. The owner, glided the aircraft back to a beautiful gear down landing and Jamie bought the aircraft less the value of an overhaul. A happy, another happy story. Phil, over to you, my friend. Okay. So we're now talking about the first annual. Well, you've been flying your new airplane for almost a year and it's time for that first annual inspection. Hopefully you've selected a trusted and reputable maintenance shop to look after your new airplane. As we said earlier, not all shops are created equal. Find, finding the right shop is not only about price, but more importantly about trust and quality. After all, you're putting your life 
in their hands. Talk to your friends who are aircraft owners and get their recommendations. The pre-purchase inspection should have identified a number and hopefully a small number of items that uh, require uh, attention. Air, airworthiness directive, safety bulletins, and safety related items should be dealt with ra uh, uh, right after that pre-purchase. Well, uh... Left over from the pre-purchase inspection are discretionary items or nice to have, but not essential. Consider adding uh, them to your aircraft li uh, mechanics list. The annual inspection, as we said earlier, is two parts. Step one, remove all the inspection panels, cowling, seats, perform a compression test on the engine, uh, document and check all the airworthiness, airworthiness directives and service bulletins, uh, just to name uh, a few. This will create a list of must-dos, should-dos, and items which could be deferred depending upon your budget. After part one is complete, you should meet face-to-face -face with your mechanics to review the results of the inspection, working out estimates for each item to, uh, to be repaired, the cost of the parts, and the time required to, uh, to implement, and determine uh, what's going to be repaired. You end up with a budget to execute the second phase of the annual, avoiding that heart-clenching surprise when you get the bill uh, in the mail uh, for the annual inspection. Transport Canada has a website for continued airworthiness directives called CAUSE. You can search for your aircraft with your registration mark. The system brings up a list of ADs and their number for your specific airframe, engine, and propeller. Miscellaneous equipment like uh, avionics are not included uh, in the search and requires a separate search on the CAUSE uh, website. Critical dates should be identified and documented either in the logbooks or in a spreadsheet. This would include time-sensitive maintenance like oil changes, magneto inspections, IFR certifications, ELT batteries. Effective August 1 of 2019, ELT, ELT testing requirements have changed, requiring a performance test every two years and an operational test every 12 months. The two-year performance testing must be completed by an avionics shop that has the proper ELT testing equipment. The annual operations test can be completed by the pilot owner. The first annual is a perfect time to install new uh, upgrades. With the aircraft taken apart to a thousand pieces, that's a uh, uh, tongue-in-cheek, of course, it's a perfect time to install new wiring and hardware, as is uh, the case of uh, ADSB install or installing a new graphic engine monitor or uh, panel mounted USB power ports. The idea being that you can save some uh, labor hours with the aircraft opened up for the inspection. USB power ports are becoming quite popular add-ons. Most if not all brand new aircraft come with copious amounts of USB charging ports. In fact, Companies like True Blue Power and PS Engineering are including them in chronometers and uh, audio panels. Well, fundamentally, aircraft ownership is about dealing with the unknown. For the most part, well-maintained aircraft are pretty reliable, but as they say, stuff happens. Another friend of mine picked up a nail in his tire on a flyout to Picton, resulting in a flat tire. Picton's a large airport, which has seen better days. There are no maintenance shops or mechanics on the field. The owner left the air, uh, airplane uh, and got a ride back to Toronto, uh, which was much better than a decision to try to use Canadian tire fix a flat ceiling. His mechanics and instructor drove out from Toronto to change the tire with the instructor flying the airplane home safely. Over the course of time, new ADs are released by the FAA and transport. Financially, these can't be modeled uh, when you're investigating purchasing your aircraft because uh, they're unknown. When aircraft components fail on older aircraft, there could be hidden costs associated with repairing or replacing the part, especially when you're dealing with the border. I recently tried to uh, had to uh, replace a manifold pressure gauge in the commander. I was able to source a replacement gauge, which was worth about $250. Uh, 
the shipping costs were $25, but the UPS brokerage fees and taxes were roughly $125. New government mandates add compliance-based costs to our future obligate, uh, obligate uh, to our financial obligations. More recently, Canada has mandated the replacement of 121.5 megahertz ELTs with 406 megahertz ELTs. Depending on your aircraft ELT requirements and options, the cost could be as much as $2,000 or or more uh, or more. When Canada's when Canada mandates ADSB out uh, requiring antenna diversity, the cost of compliance could soar to $15,000 or more, uh, again, depending upon the technology. You might uh, consider UAVionics Tail Beacon X and AV30 panel display. The hardware is roughly $4,194 uh, USD. The installation uh, labor should be less than eight hours, again, depending upon the complexity of your aircraft. Over to you, Pete. Thanks, Phil. Uh, let's talk about discretionary costs. After a few years of owning your airplane, uh, and that new smell is uh, long gone, you might consider upgrading your aircraft. A great way, a great place to see and talk to vendors are aviation events like Sun and Fun in Florida and uh, EAA Adventure in Wisconsin. More modestly, COPA's National Fly-In in which in 2022 will hopefully not be virtual, and our Aviation Expo. I think the pilot owners take pride in ownership, and they are certainly on that endless go faster upgrade, add some farkles to my airplane path. There's an endless amount of upgrades and pilot accessories which can fill your flight bag. In the motorcycle business, we call this farkling, which is a funny word. Uh, a good rule of thumb for, for, thumb for performing upgrades is that a one knot of speed improvement will cost you about a thousand bucks. Companies like Lopresti Aviation, now owned by Wellen and Knots to You, have airframe mods like flap gap seals and special NACA cowls that can make a world of difference to your aircraft's performance. Some upgrades add safety enhancements to the aircraft as well, such as LED lighting, which can be and typically are much brighter than the old ones, and uh, will also last a lot time longer than those traditional incandescent light bulbs. For night ops, the difference can literally be eye-opening. Pun there. USB charging is becoming more important as we pilots are carrying more electronic devices in our flight bags, such as iPhones, iPads, and such. Garmin ADS-B receivers, numerous scout transponders, USB flashlights, and the like. Having stc and TSO'd panel-mounted charging ports, which are just, which are called NOR-C uh, devices, will charge those devices in, your, in the event that you forget to bring them up to speed the night before that long cross-country flight. Those certified panel-mounted USB ports are much better than those inexpensive USB cigarette adapters, especially if your aircraft is a 28 volt electrical system. Some, by the way, some inexpensive USB cigarette adapters can contribute electromagnetic interference and radio frequency interference to both our GPS receivers and other navigation devices, which could manifest itself in your aircraft as radio problems. So spending a little bit of extra time and money can troubleshoot a lot of radio problems uh, because it turned out to be a bad power adapter. Part of discretionary costs also include pilot safety supplies, like a really good pair of aviator sunglasses and good noise canceling headsets. It is your head and your hearing and your eyes. And those are all things that you want to protect. Fundamental to protecting your license and uh, your medical. You might also consider a good set of aviator shoes and maybe even a flight helmet. For ultralight aerobatic and jet pilots like myself, head protection is highly desirable and in some cases a regulatory requirement. Carrying a good survival kit is a must, especially if you're flying over unpopulated areas. And let's face it, most of Canada is unpopulated. COPA has set up a 15% discount with Crash Kit International 
who manufacture aviation grade survival equipment. Don't forget also about annual membership to organizations like COPA, local flying clubs, AOPA, and the EAA. And you might want to create a budget for annual one-time expenditures. As you know, pilots and gadgets are synonymous. Okay, upgrades. As we as our aircraft age, as aircraft age, panel, paint, and interior upgrades will come to the pilot's owner's mind. Over the past decade, there have been a revolution in avionics, seeing a migration from legendary steam gauges to beautiful glass cockpit displays and tech technology. Combining that with autopilot upgrades, it's very easy to spend a cool $100,000 or more uh, investing into converting that aircraft, that old tired panel, into something beautiful and new. One-time uh, capital upgrades will help improve the longevity of both the aircraft, the engine, certainly will help the resale value as well. In Canada, engine preheaters really are, in my mind, a must. Both companies, Tannis and Reef, have engine and cockpit heaters, which will preheat the aircraft safely in a matter of a few hours. If you ever tried to start a cold soaked engine when the outside air temperature is below zero, uh, it's a struggle and could also damage the engine, if not flatten the battery, and may lead to you having to spend money on things like a new battery. The urban legend for aviation is that starting a cold soaked in equivalent cold soaked engine is the equivalent of 500 hours of use so with an engine reserve of twenty dollars an hour you're talking about maybe the equivalent of ten thousand dollars worth of usage in that life of your engine and that may mean that your overhaul comes a lot sooner than originally anticipated as mentioned earlier uh, another upgrade mechanical traditional magnetos are required to be inspected and repaired every 500 hours, but there are new on-the-scene solid-state magnetos. The Surefly electronic ignition manufacturer has STC, so approved solid-state magnetos, for both four-cylinder and six-cylinder engines uh, out there in our aircraft. Recently, Lycoming has decided to equip their aircraft from the factory, OEM, with solid state magnetos. The product is called Lycoming EIS. With no moving parts, these magnetos do not require an inspection repair. They have a 2400 hour service life. At 24 hour, 2400 hours, we simply send them back to Surefly. We'll send you a big magneto at a discounted price. And guess what? You've saved uh, four or five inspection costs. The magneto literally almost pays for its health. This approach does not differ, uh, deliver infant mortality syndrome, especially the issue of removing a perfectly good mag and having the overhaul and repair and due to reduce problems caused by maintenance related failures. Check out, check this out at surefly.aero. Some aircraft owners have also invested into owning or leasing hangar space. Hangar upgrades are part of that pilot psychic of creating a man cave environment at the airport. A friend of my hangar in Waterloo is <laughs> beautiful, equipped with office furniture, washroom, shower, internet, TV, and is both heated and air conditioned. Truly a home away from home. From a micro real estate perspective, although a limited marketplace, investing into your hangar improvements should increase the value of the hangar at time of resale. Don't forget that all that all you're invested in those upgrades, your return on the investment is probably about 50 to 60% at the time of sale of the aircraft. Bill? Okay. On the horizon, as we said earlier, aircraft ownership is about managing costs and looking into the future. On the horizon, there are a number of new Canadian initiatives that will require installation of new hardware. We've been talking about ADSB for over a decade with the U.S. providing information about their mandate. Just as a reminder, uh, the U.S. mandate became effective Jan 1, 2020. Essentially, any uh, U.S. airspace where a transponder is required, ADSB out, uh, ADSB out is mandated. 
NAV Canada implemented ADSB out trials in James Bay in 2009. Uh, uh, the eastern portion of the Canadian North in 2010 and the northeast coast of Canada in 2011 2012, supporting air navigation services to high flyers. In November of 2012, Arion LE LLC was formed as a joint venture between NAV Canada and Iridium Communications, which facilitated the investment into space-based 1090 ES ADSB out services. The uh, Arion space-based ADSB system went live in March 2019, providing 100% uh, worldwide uh, coverage. Space-based ADSB will be used for surveillance in Class A and Class B. Uh, airspace according to the dates identified in the Canadian space-based ADSB performance requirements mandate aeronautical study. The challenge to the ADSB conversation is a divergence of technologies between the U.S. and the rest of the world. Canada, util, uh, as we said, utilizes a space-based ADSB out system while the American system is ground-based. What does that mean for a GA airplane? To meet the U.S. mandate, the ADSB out antenna must be mounted on the belly of the aircraft facing the ground. Canadian mandate will require an ADSB antenna mounted in such a manner that it faces the sky. This is called diversity. The typical panel mounted ADSB out technology, you can kind of think of it as two transponders in one box. This is where uh, the folks, uh, uh, the, uh, the conversation gets interesting based upon uh, the uh, UAVionics, who have been collaborating with NAV Canada and COPA in the flight trials of their solution called Tail Beacon X. Tail Beacon X is an ADSB out transponder with a dipole antenna. Kind of think of an X. Tail Beacon X replaces the aircraft's rear navigation light and requires a panel mounted instrument like their AV30C to control the transponder. After all, the transponder is now outside of the aircraft on, uh, on the tail. Tail Beacon X can be installed on an experimental aircraft today with air, uh, FAA certification for the certified version almost com uh, complete. Uh, Arion has implemented a new service called Arion Alert, which utilizes ADSB tracking to provide Arion customers with access to an aircraft's in-flight digital footprint. This allows an organization like Search and Rescue during the prosecution of an overdue aircraft to find the track of an aircraft and its last ADSB reported point. Interestingly, an American GA pilot who ditched uh, in the Bahamas was found based upon the Arian data. Adding in oceanic currents, the U.S. Coast Guard was able to rescue the aviator treading water within three feet of the projected location. The Arion Alert product provides data points uh, that the system, when augmented with big data and in analytics, it's all computer IT stuff, could be used to augment or replace 121.5 and 406 ELTs with the, the goal of minimizing or eliminating ELT false positives and ELTs uh, not activated during uh uh, an accident, uh, an event, uh, 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 or a, uh, an event. Well, as you've probably heard, we finally have a regulatory requirement to upgrade our 121.5 ELTs to 406s with a 2025 deadline. In November of 2020, Transport Canada, Canada amended the cars. For those that want a little light reading, that's 605.38 requiring a 406 to be installed no later um, than 2025. Now, just so we all remember, in 2009, the International Co Cospas Sarsat system abandoned uh, monitoring of emergency beacons on 121.5 in favor of 406 megahertz beacons, creating an inflection point uh, for change. 121.5, uh, megahertz signals are typically monitored by high flyers and aircraft on the ground after landing. If you still have a 121.5 megahertz ELT and it goes off, there's no assurance that search and rescue will be coming to get you or your passengers 
out of way, uh, harm's way. With the looming deadline, now's a good time to consider implementing a 406 uh, beacon. At the very least, consider a personal manually operated 406 megahertz beacon or a personal locating device like a Find Me Spot or Garmin uh, inReach. Okay, the next one. Well, as we said, aircraft ownership's not for the faint of heart. Uh, as they say, how do you become a millionaire in aviation? Start with being a billionaire. Partnerships and block times uh, are excellent strategies to balance aircraft ownership with financial responsibilities. As mentioned earlier, GA aircraft spend a lot of their lives uh, on the ground. Having one or, or two more partners not only balances financial responsibility, but also um, adds a, an element of, uh, of social, uh, social socializing to the aircraft. It's important to pick your future partner wisely. It's critical that you and your partners be like-minded, especially when it comes to making decisions which impact safety and cost. Depending upon a variety of factors, you may pl uh, consider placing the aircraft into a corporation. In theory, this should provide some limited liability as the action, actions of your partners could impact you. You should uh, be especially concerned of an event whereby a court judge judgment exceeds the liability limits of your aircraft insurance before creating the partnership and at the end uh, of, and at the beginning of the uh, aircraft acquisition pro process, consider engaging an aviation-focused law firm like YYZ Law to create the necessary documents like a partnership agreement, shareholders agreement, block time rental agreement, just to name a few. And don't forget, there's also a number of agreements on COPA's uh, 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 website. Uh, block time is an uh, excellent way to facilitate some cost recovery while flying the aircraft more. It's a count counterintuitive, but the maintenance costs uh, on an aircraft which f flies routinely will be less than those hangar queens. Block time is an excellent vehicle based upon competent and prof proficient pilots to achieve a variety of goals. Often block timers will even help washing and waxing the airplane. Check out Flight Club ca or flightclub.com, a Canadian internet platform designed to bring owners and renters together. Their platform provides scheduling, billing, and reporting solutions, easing the administrative burden uh, for the uh, aircraft. Over to you, Peter. Thanks, Phil. Let's jump a slide here. Yeah, no, tracking costs. Right on. So we've talked a lot about costs, but let's talk about tracking those costs. Some pilot owners turn a blind eye to their ownership costs, okay? They may have a budget in mind, but ultimately balance their overall living budgets to accommodate their aircraft ownership. Of course, there's the odd pilot who wins the lottery and just doesn't care, but I personally don't know any. If you have a significant other in your personal life, maintaining an annual budget will help minimize any surprises and, more importantly, any points of tension. As they say, happy wife, happy life, happy spouse, happy house. Spreadsheets like Excel, oops, spreadsheets like Excel, uh, where did I go here, are excellent tools to track all of your expenses. You can create categories for each expenses and to help you understand your costs and help make better decisions. You can ask yourself, have we spent too much on maintenance this year and perhaps defer an upgrade like ADS, uh, ADS be out? until next year now that it looks like it's not going to be required until 2026. If you're incorporated, the more details you provide to your accountant, the less your accounting fees will likely be. Clearly, if you deliver a shoebox full of invoices, be prepared to pay for that later in the year. An interesting outcome of using tools to track your aircraft expenditures are cool graphics and charts like you see here. They illustrate costs increase over time. Phil, that clever guy, has been using this approach for the past 11 years, and it's an eye-opener as you see the cost escalation of big-ticket items, such as insurance, maintenance, and hangers, and the costs are so easy to see. So let's talk about a perfect outcome. 
We're talking about C Copa's president and my boss and CEO, Christine Gervais. She, like many others, has been dreaming of owner, owning her own aircraft for years. This year, the stars aligned, allowing her dream to be realized. Within one month of starting her search, she closed in on a Cessna 172 Golf model living its life in Northern Ontario. Its former owner had numerous aircraft in his fleet, and as with many older pilots, had decided to thin out the herd. Christine began her journey by creating a mission profile. As a chief flying instructor, training her son was at the top of her list. Business travel to attend COPA flight meetings and COPA conventions was another key factor. Finally, weekend flyouts for those $200 hamburgers was another driver. Settling on a 172, her next task was to find one, ideally in Canada. And as with many things in life, Kismet drew her to this Cessna, hiding away in Timmins, Ontario. The former owner treated his aircraft like part of his family, well-maintained and with pride of ownership. The aircraft only had 4,300 hours total time, none of it in the hands of a flight school, and only 450 hours since major overhaul. The panel and radios had some older components, including, but did include a Mozi transponder. The pre-purchase inspection and test flights were conducted in Timmins. And during the pre-purchase inspection, a few snags were found, but not uncommon for a 45-year-old, sorry, 55-year-old airplane. During the purchase process, Christine used a number of resources which can be found on our members' benefits page, chief of which were a few trusted advisors who helped her along the way. From Christine's perspective, the aircraft purchase process had very few speed bumps. Again, she bought an airplane from someone she knew and trusted. With no outstanding ADs or service bulletins, the focus shifted to upgrades and flying the plane. With a positive view of the logbooks, Christine and her trusted Ottawa-based AME traveled to Timmins to fly the aircraft and conducted a pre-purchase inspection. The inspection revealed a pretty clean airplane, which was not surprising if you knew the seller of the aircraft. The transition process took two trips to Timmins to finalize. Fortunately, it was done during the spring and summer months, helping to negate weather delays associated with test flights and cross countries back to Smith Falls. With the pre-purchase behind her and the aircraft now relocated to the Smith Falls area of Ottawa, Christine secured hangar space and insurance. From the beginning of the process, Christine began thinking about upgrades, some now and some in the future. The upgrades will be implemented in three phases. Phase one is about avionics. After all, Cessna 172s tend to be basic aircraft. Avionic upgrades include a digital HSI, a CDI, touchscreen GPS, a second radio that's also VOR and GPS, an autopilot, ADSB in and out, and an engine monitor, all of which are needs versus wants based on her missions. Phase two will focus on paint and phase three on the interior. And as with most aircraft, once you have a few years of aircraft ownership behind you, more things will come along and move from the nice to have to the must have column. Okay, lessons learned. It's a really good story with a positive outcome, all based upon trust. Now let's hear, let's hear from Christine about her new aircraft, Fuzzer, and her lessons learned. So I'm just going to get this cranked up here. So my journey started long before I found the aircraft. And so when I finally did, what I did is I put the word out. I just I just told as many people as I could in, in my network of people uh, what I was looking for. And one of one of these people came through and and found me uh, found me my feather. I'm like, OK, so now now what do I do? Um, so luckily I, I did have the Copa guides to, to help me. Um, I got to say, uh, I'm not going to take any credit for it, but they are very well written, very good step-by-step -step guides. And because my airplane, as with probably most, most airplanes that you're looking at are not at your, at your home airport, it's not like driving to a car lot to look at a used car. 
Um, it, it, it was about, you know, making arrangements to actually see it and, you know, and, and to maximize the time. Um, so I did find a, a friend who volunteered to fly me to my aircraft was, uh, was in Timmins. So I, I did find a, a friend who volunteered to, to take me to Timmins. And so what we did there, uh, the first visit was really look through all of the log books to to make sure that all of the paperwork uh, was in order. Um, I did have uh, an AME um, on uh, FaceTime and we did a, a preliminary um, sort of uh, walkthrough of the aircraft. He, he told me where to, to put the camera and he would look at it. And uh, we virtually looked at the, uh, the, he virtually looked at the logbooks as well. He was familiar with the aircraft. So that kind of helped as well. It helped with the process. Um, he had done some maintenance on that aircraft uh, before, so he he was familiar with the airplane in question. And uh, and then after that, so I, I took everything back with me. Well, not all the books, but a lot of the documentation with me. Uh, and then it was about really um, getting the funding together and uh, finding another friend who can <laughs> fly me to Timmins again, because this is during a pandemic as well. So I did find another friend who also volunteered to, uh, they wanted to go on an adventure, and uh, so they flew me to Timmins. And uh, lucky for me, I do have relatives that live there, and uh, because of the being vaccinated, we could actually see them the second time I went there. So that was kind of nice. So for me, it was an overall very, very good experience. There's still a lot of paperwork, and and some lessons learned, uh, lots, uh, quite a few lessons learned uh, in the process. Not 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 bad ones, just just lessons learned. Um, so I would say that um, the one thing you have to do when you're looking for an airplane is really set your budget and stick to it, uh, because you can easily uh, go over. So um, for me, uh, I, I really stuck to to my budget, and it's like I can't go over this. And then the other lesson learned is buying a used airplane is is very very different than buying a used car, in the sense that if something is not completely okay, I think you need to plan for the unexpected when it comes to a used airplane. And these are not necessarily things that even the current owner actually knows anything about. Because oftentimes we are at the mercy of our mechanic. And I think that the best advice that somebody ever gave me, um, somebody told me that if I'm going to own an airplane, actually, I think it was one of our directors, uh, Brian Pinsent, who said, Christine, you're gonna have to be willing to get your hands dirty and you're going to have to be as involved in that airplane as your Amy. I think I've been lucky, too, that it's had one owner for the last 41 years. I, I really do feel that I, I was lucky in finding this gem. Even with these unpredictable little hiccups that are happening, I think, like I said, you, you have to be able to, you have to be ready for that, which is maybe something I wasn't ready for, but I do understand that they happen and you just have to be ready for them. I have to say that it's been one of the best journeys and the most enriching and the most gratifying journeys that I've been on. And I've been on many. This one is like, this is like a dream come true. And it was, it was, uh, it, it, it was a, it was a great journey. I, I have to say I'm over the moon. All right. We'll just get back to our slides here. And I'm going to turn it over to Phil. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the flip side of the coin, my friend Marvin. Earlier this year, Marvin decided to upgrade from an ultralight permit to a recreational pilot license. Um, Marvin owns a, a Zen Air Zodiac 601 ultralight and has roughly 135 hours under his belt. Marvin found that although Zodiac was a great flying airplane, the regulatory limitations of his permit was limiting his flying. And this prompted him to think about purchasing a certified airplane. His hunt began in January of 2021. During COVID-19, the marketplace uh, shifted to a seller's marketplace with many airplanes coming to the market and then selling very quickly. Marvin visited aircraft sales websites twice a day, hunting for that perfect airplane. And he found it, a Beechcraft in Cornwall, which on the surface was a Cherry airplane. And it was listed for $37,000, well within his budget. 
He jumped on the phone to call the seller, only to find out that another buyer had called not one hour before Marvin. The seller felt compelled to sell the airplane to the first buyer. The aircraft transaction closed. The new owner uh, picked up the airplane and relatively quick, uh, relatively quickly relisted the airplane for sale at, I understand, roughly $60,000. This marketplace experience was in Marvin's mind when he found a Cherokee 140 for sale in uh, Ontario. Marvin jumped on the opportunity, quickly placing it under contract without ever seeing the aircraft. The whole process was completed while Marvin was out of Canada and upon return under COVID-19 quarantine. The aircraft was moved by the owner to Toronto for a pre-purchase inspection. Marvin had returned to Canada, uh, but was in a COVID-19 quarantine for two weeks. So as such, he wasn't able to see the aircraft or test fly. He did have a few of his flying buddies drop by f to uh, look at her. They all gave her um, gave uh, Marvin a, a thumbs up. None of them flew the aircraft. Uh, and I don't believe uh, reviewed the results of the pre-purchase inspection. With this being uh, Marvin's first certified aircraft acquisition, he didn't know what he didn't know. The results uh, of the pre-purchase found a, a number of defects, uh, defects, which helped Marvin with the final price negotiations. He decided to proceed with the acquisition of the aircraft. Once the transaction had closed, the mechanics began working on fixing the issues found during the pre-purchase. Well, critical to, pre, to a pre-purchase inspection, uh, as we've said uh, repeatedly, is test fly the aircraft, which in Marvin's case uh, didn't happen. This, was, uh, uh, this is one way to make sure that the aircraft flies straight and true and that all the instruments and avionics are working. After Marvin took possession of the aircraft, he began flying with his buddies, who acted as pilot in command. They quickly found that one of the comm radios was dead and the other one had a lot of noise on it, making it somewhat unusable. Marvin got a few quotes from a variety of avionics shops and eventually selected a shop to do the work. Once the avionics tech saw the panel, um, they determined that some of the avionics hardware was not STC'd or TSO'd, for installation into a certified aircraft, essentially making the aircraft unairworthy. So out came the uncertified hardware and in went the proper uh, proper gear. Obviously, this impacted the investment into the aircraft, essentially with hidden costs percolating to the surface. The avionics are now installed in the uh, aircraft, resulting in Marvin now beginning his journey to up upgrade to a recreational license making his flight instructor happy to have a new student under his wing. Future upgrades will include new lap belts and adding shoulder belts in. To make the flights more comfortable, especially during those hot and humid Ontario summer months, Marvin's buying this cool portable air conditioner. Essentially, not only uh, to Marvin's creature comfort, uh, but probably more importantly to his, uh, to his wife. Marvin learned a lot of lessons from his journey. And it's probably best just to listen to Marvin talk about his uh, journey and uh, his lessons learned. Pete, do you want to well, play the... Uh, yeah, let me get that for you. Thanks. Do, do, do. Okay, here we go, Marvin. Start the video. Well, um, when I, as I said, when I bought the plane, uh, I was out of the country and um i had it uh, had it flown in for a, a pre-purchase at buttonville and uh, unfortunately i wasn't there for either for the flight i never flew in the plane I, i'm i'm still out of the country actually i think from the timing is i actually came back in but i was in quarantine pete i think um, you need to mute your mic COVID. and so i couldn't attend uh, the pre-purchase inspection i was quarant still quarantining at home from a from a timing perspective, and so I had a few of my my buddies were out there um, when the plane arrived, and again I had uh, neither I or or they had flown in the plane, so the uh, the owner flew it in, and um, the arrangements for the pre-purchase inspection and that that happened, 
and they, you know, they identified a, a number of things that needed to get fixed on the plane. Well, I, it wasn't a, a, a total, uh, uh, I, I guess from my perspective, it wasn't a complete story in terms of what deficiencies the aircraft had. Surprise, surprise, but it certainly cost a, a lot more money than I had anticipated in terms of what the initial uh, uh, upfront costs were going to be in terms of getting the plane in a, uh, oh, uh, airworthy condition and, and usable condition. And I guess also a disadvantage is that you know not, not having um, been a, a Piper owner, uh, a Cherokee owner, you know, not knowing what the characteristics. First of all, I didn't fl- I didn't fly the plane, you know, didn't have the opportunity to. And even if I did, um, I, I certainly would have had someone who's owned a Piper Cherokee, uh, knowing how it handles and flies. So as, you know, you don't know what you don't know, and um, you you really want someone who's you know been in that position where they've you know are familiar with the t- the, the type because as we all know uh, all the aircraft handle a bit differently okay so there's marvin's story i'll just get back to the slides <clears throat> all right so let's just restart that so uh, we need to dot the I's and cross the T's, and that's where we are in our journey to aircraft ownership. It's really essential that you not be a glass half full or empty person. In other words, be trust neutral. That is to say, verify the seller's information through reviewing all the logbooks, test flying the aircraft with somebody who has time on type, and have a detailed pre-purse inspection uh, which covers both the airplane the power plant, and the avionics, the whole airplane. Ensure that you have an appropriate offer to purchase and closing documents executed. Based upon the cost of the aircraft, you might consider engaging legal counsel to review or create the documents. Ideally, a lawyer who has aircraft experience. There are not that many around. This sets you up for recourse in the event that the seller has made misrepresentations errors or omissions if the seller of the aircraft is selling a certified aircraft and agrees that you will be buying a certified aircraft then the cost to remediate any airworthiness issues is the cost to the seller not to the buyer as with most legal documents they should be balanced both to the sellers and the buyers needs if you're present if, if you're presented by the seller with an offer to purchase agreement which is slanted in favor of the seller, you might consider rewriting the offer or moving on to the next airplane. This is where independent legal counsel's value comes into play. Delivering a dispassionate legal document, just like everything we've talked about so far, as well as being part of the transaction closing process. Critical to the closing process is ensuring a smooth transition of title from the seller to you and ensuring that the aircraft is clean. I don't mean clean of bird crap. I mean rather clean of outstanding liens, lawsuits, or other encumbrances from things like the mechanic who never got paid for the last annual. The FAA makes this a lot easier with all liens required to be registered with them. Sadly, in Canada, we have to search by province and territory individually. Don't forget that for Canadian registered aircraft, you can look up the history of the aircraft and its mark. You can search the aircraft registry database to see if the make, model, and serial number or the mark itself. Don't forget that as an aircraft are bought and sold, there could be gaps in the mark. As well, there are the AIAAIR reports which Transport Canada requires submitted by the aircraft owner annually. These reports include time on aircraft over the last year, who the mechanics are, and any damage history. During COVID, TC has been a bit slow doing the processing of AAR reports and currently, as a result, TC is not fully up to date. Finally, don't forget to ensure that the certificate of registration is transferred to you before the three-month interim CFR process expires. Critical to ensure the aircraft is to have insurance in place before closing. Don't move it without insurance. Don't forget that there is a lot of valuable information in the member benefits section on the COPA website on buying airplanes. Okay. 
wrap up time. So the jump from renting an aircraft from a flight school to owning and flying your own airplane is beautiful and eye-opening. If you're the sole owner with no block times, no block timers, then you can leave a lot of your gear in the airplane, just like the way you treat your car. The walk around is always the same. The relationship between the aircraft and the pilot is always the same. This consistency really changes the whole flight experience. You can take the aircraft away on a two week vacation without worrying about bringing it back on time for the next renter. You can make weather, go no go decisions, knocked and packed by get their itis. The pride of ownership and safety quotients are, in fact, priceless. In Copa's Flight Magazine, we started a recurring feature called Plane Investments. So far, there have been articles on a variety of financially focused topics, including total cost of ownership, buying your first airplane, selling your aircraft, luxury tax implications, and in the August edition, you are reading about the partnership, uh, on our, an article on partnerships. Hopefully, each of these has given you an appreciation for owning and flying your own aircraft. After all, for some of us, owning an aircraft is a discretionary purchase, a first world benefit. Take some time and work out and work out the total cost of ownership, confirming that you can afford this aspect of the freedom of flight. Don't forget, please, COPA's website under Members Benefits and COPA Guides that contain a number of documents which provide a rich information about owning and operating many types of aircraft. Lastly, a shameless plug for Phil's great Plane Talk podcast on his website, planetalk.ca, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcast, and Spotify. Phil has been really busy. He's got over 68 podcasts published. This webinar tonight will be posted on COPA's website if you want to replay it, and please do. We'd love to see you do that. All right, here is Phil's contact information. Whoop, I better change this slide. Here's Phil's contact information. It's all there in black and white and blue and a pretty picture of a beautiful Harvard as well. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions or comments. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a few questions. My gosh, that was an excellent presentation. I'm sure there was many in the room just jotting down note after note after note. Um, Phil, Peter, thank you very much. You took us through quite the journey there uh, from narrowing down your search, being practical and, and thinking uh, some really good considerations to the cost to um, even reviewing logbooks. Um, I'll jump into some questions. We don't have a ton of time for too many. Um, I, and I have listed a bunch of links there in, in the comment section, so you can easily copy and paste them as well. I won't put all of them, so I won't uh, spam everyone here. Um, one question uh, being, do you have any sense of the current percentage of hull value that is included in the overall premium? I know Phil said one and a half to four percent in our presentation. Um, Phil, do you have any comments on that one? Sure. Yeah, the math looks like your premium um, can be anywhere up to four or more percent. So if you're working the numbers backwards, the, the, uh, from a premium perspective, the liability insurance part is the inexpensive part. Um, again, depending on, uh, on, spe uh, with, uh, on specifics, but typically it's $900. Then you look. Uh, then you add into that a percentage of uh, of the uh, the hull value. Again, uh, one point eight to four uh, percent, based upon uh, the specifics of the uh, the aircraft, the specifics of the uh, of the pilots. Very good. Um, Brian Schalm confirms that he has four pages of notes, so tons of tons <laughs> of useful information here. Yikes. <laughs> Um, so earlier you had mentioned how the U.S., the, their logbooks only require technical information. There's somebody who had a question here of, um, in supporting your, their decision making for, for purchasing an aircraft where the U.S. logs are not available. Uh, they, they mentioned that there's uh, only from uh, a little over 1,800 hours and subsequent oh, and yeah. no books prior to January 8th, 1981 onwards. So... 
I just want to make sure I understand. So there are no books since 1981 till now or from when the aircraft was manufactured uh, to 1981. Just not clear to me which way, which, what's missing, the early years or the more recent years. I think from what we said tonight, I think any gap is significant. And if it's if it's a almost a 40 year gap, uh, unless it's free, I'd walk away. That's my that's my take on it. You don't know what you're buying. Yeah, and the log books are going to be critical um, about uh, when it's time to import the uh, the aircraft. So hopefully, uh, the question was focusing on you know, log books from uh, the birth of the aircraft to. 1981. Uh, American aircraft, when they make any changes, they have a process called a 337. Mm. And the 337s, which are uh, created by the mechanics and put into the aircraft's uh, uh, logbook, they're also sent over to the FAA and kept forever. So um, another uh, thing that you can do when you're uh, looking for an airplane is to go um, uh, go to the uh, FAA, uh, do a search on the on the tail number of the aircraft. Uh, there's a small fee. You can get all the uh, records that the uh, the FAA uh, have. Again, this is really a question of you know. Again, 1981 was like a long time ago. Uh, the real question is: Did the aircraft ha sustain any damage history? How many owners has uh, has it uh, changed hands? Where is it being flying? And the the problem is, especially with corrosion, is you can't really see it until it uh, per percolates up to the surface. It's not. It's kind of a little, I, I suppose, a little different than a, a car because we are talking about aluminum versus, you know, uh, versus steel. So uh, again, it could be a little challenging. Um, Certainly, there's absolutely no no doubt it's going to diminish the value of the airplane. Uh, again, if we were in a, a marketplace of uh, quote unquote sanity, so kind of not. All righty, and uh, confirming that it was the early uh, only the early books missing here. Mm. Um, there is another question as it relates to aircraft in the U.S. Um, as a Canadian, is there an advantage in upfront and ongoing costs in purchasing and registering an aircraft in the U.S.? Uh, and I think that a lot of the considerations you added in here would should, should be uh, definitely um, considered by the the individual who asked the question. But I'll I'll kick it over to uh, either of you two. So if we're talking about leaving, if you will, an aircraft bought in the States, in the States, and not bringing in the Canada, um, that is an interesting um, possibility. I know people who have done that. One of the challenges that can raise its, um, raise its ugly face is on the registration of the aircraft by a Canadian in the States. Uh, one, one we should know, recognize for the fact that if I was an American citizen, I could not buy and register a Canadian airplane in Canada. Now, I'm not sure about the American rule. I don't think it's quite as rigorous as ours is, but um, it's something that you would want to uh, investigate very carefully if that's what the question is. Well, and then we should also remember that, uh, as you pointed out, Pete, it's also about where's the airplane going to live. Yeah. There are the FAA and Transport Canada have rules around the number of hours they're out of uh, their domestic airspace. That's right. Now, so that's a, another, you know, complexity. When we start to talk about foreign ownership of uh uh, an, uh, an American uh, registered uh, aircraft. There's some workarounds, which is about having an American corporation uh, uh, own uh, the aircraft, and you can set up uh, mm. numbered companies in Delaware, oh, using yeah. American lawyers. Yeah. And again, it's back to the 
cost of the aircraft. You know, are we talking about a thirty thousand uh, dollar Cessna one hundred and fifty two, uh, or a uh, three million dollar TBM? Yeah. So that's again another, you know, another consideration. Well, if it's a three million dollar aircraft out there, I'm looking for new friends. Uh, forever ask that question. <laughs> Um, moving forward here, uh, and I'll, I'll just ask two more questions. Um, there's one on hang ridge options and the rules around them. Uh, would either of you speak to that? And th this was a, a question that was pre-submitted uh, prior to the seminar. It's funny. There's an article, my article in the September magazine, which I've written and will be published and out next month, uh, is kind of on that. So really... It, it, it really is, it's, there's not enough time tonight to talk about it, but basically it's in very broad strokes, um, in most cases at an airport, if they are leasing space, the terrain, for you to build a hangar on their property, that is the typical sort of thing you will see at most small to medium size registered versus certified air airports, aerodromes, like Smith's Falls, for instance, or uh, CARP, or to, to, to two examples around Ontario. Um, there has to be uh, property available for you to build on, right? Uh, the other option is you buy uh, an existing hangar, and you would assume the land lease for the property that the hangar is sitting on. Uh, alternative, you, you might be renting space in that hangar. Uh, in a few cases, a very few cases, the airport may own the hangar and the property that it's sitting on and then lease the hangar to you. Um, there are places where you just rent the hangar from the airport owner. They're all interesting because whenever the the land lease holder or the hangar lease owner has a change of heart, I hate to say it, but inevitably somebody gets the short end of the stick and it's not the airport owner. Example, bad example, but example nonetheless, uh, the old expression buyer beware um, the airport manager of the Grimsby Airport here in St. Catharines decided that he had enough. The airport, um, the landowners of the airport decided they wanted a new airport manager. They got one. The airport manager said, told all these people, nobody owns the hangar there. They're all renting or leasing. The new airport manager this year said, good news. Your rates are going up. In fact, your rates are going to double because you're not paying enough. All your current agreements are canceled, and you have a choice. You can pay a year in advance because your rent is only going to be a year at a time, and you have a choice of paying me monthly, or you can pay me a whole year in advance. That's the sort of situation you could end up in. Not fun. Uh, very chilling example. <laughs> well, I Thank you. I throw that out. They're not all like that. Trust me, <laughs> not all like that. Most of them aren't, but they do exist. Very good. Um, we we're at the very end. I know it's late, uh, so. Peter, if I can ask you a final question just on the luxury aircraft tax, I, I think it'd be worthwhile just to uh, give a, a quick um, uh, summary of it for sure. those who aren't aware. Yeah, so we all know that the Liberal government passed, uh, despite things like our, um, I guess protest is probably too strong a word, but our objections from COPA, and we had 3,000 people on the signature saying that we objected to what they were doing. Um, we have received a document this week that it would appear that as, sorry, I need to back up a little bit. So there was the intent, I believe it was in 2019, the then Liberal government was going to issue this and there was representation by COPA in other words, and maybe uh, a more caring government, I don't know, and they decided not to do it. 
it, it, the document has surfaced this week that we just received. Uh, and in that almost 60 page document, there is wording that new was after 2018, therefore 2019. And if you put it in context that this legislation gave birth to itself about then, it makes sense that new hasn't been updated, right? And new is still that date. Uh, there is an opportunity for organizations like COPA to object. So guess what? We are going to object to that. And hopefully that somebody has um, a change in heart. And that applies to boats as well. It's the same rule, the same start date. Now, there's nothing in it that would indicate that there's any retroactivity to that. In other words, if you bought an airplane a year ago, it doesn't apply, right? This is a new tax on new airplanes that they've defined new as being essentially 2019 onwards. And there are, and it's too complicated to talk about right now, but what does new mean? Is it new, new, like zero hours? Uh, Cause there's all sorts of workarounds to that too. So stay tuned folks, more to come. Stay Stay tuned, he says. Uh, and if you want to learn more about the the different positions that uh, COPA has taken on this, take a look on our website. Uh, there's plenty of materials there. So I'll leave with it with um, uh, a note from each of you of just last uh, last pieces of advice to anyone interested in buying an aircraft. You've shared a lot. Uh, so, so maybe just a quick line or, or two. Phil, you first. Well, I have to say that... Um... Owning an aircraft is absolutely priceless. It's uh, a, an interesting journey. And having done it uh, twice uh, myself, um, uh, the devil is absolutely in the, in the details. Listen to that guy. He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Very good. Well, the uh, if you haven't noticed, we're all wearing ball caps. So the ball cap squad is going to say bid you yeah. all, all adieu and I wish you all a great night. Thank you all for being here. I see you in our September um, seminar. It will be a pilot recurrent training. So it'll meet the qualifications of that two year recurrency with Transport Canada. Uh, so see you then. Look out for your email for more information on it. Have a great night, everyone. Cheers. Good night, folks. Thanks for staying. Hanging in there with us. Cheers. Cheers.